he went and looked at instances of domestic terrorism and then made a prediction uh, about political stability on a macro and micro scale of about 250 years uh, and then another time scale a bit more. Um, whereas Sir John Glubb, he's gone uh, through his life experiences serving as a uh, general uh, who unified the Arabic army at the beginning of the 20th century for about 50 years. Uh, he wrote this story uh, or this paper, I guess, about uh, his own observations anecdotally as well as from his own research uh, through his exhaustive life experience uh, internationally as well as diplomatically and civilly and politically uh, through his work and also historically actually studying history. So uh, we're going to go over it. Let me uh, enable Kali and I'll share my screen for a little overview of what we're going to be discussing. So uh, who is John Glubb? Yep, he unified Arabia's military for the first half of the 20th century through civility, diplomacy and military. Uh, and pretty much uh, the too long didn't read is Mimetic innovation does not solve empire collapse. Empire collapse occurs about every 250 years or 10 generations. And there are stages that seem to occur consistently with some overlap. The patterns are the same, the constituents are a bit different, uh, which we will go into. Uh, so one thing, there's significant background noise just in your microphone, Kelly. So I'll just say, can you mute yourself uh, if you're not speaking? Because there's like a white noise, unfortunately. Um, all right, so all right, a bit of global awareness, because uh, I know a lot of our viewers are American. Uh, this is, uh, we're talking about the history of empires for this conversation. Uh, so here's kind of, you know, the world as it goes to civilizations, not particularly uh, uh, countries or tribes, right, in terms of civilization. So it kind of starts off uh you know with the jews i guess and then kind of continues out and we also have some independent instances over in china uh, and then later on uh there's the ghana empire and some others but every now and then we'll see these huge little big huge things here like the archimenid empire uh later on uh there'll be a few others that that's pointing doing some adverts and so on so the uh what happens is there's a pattern here uh, where uh, the there was a several big empires prior. There was the Archimedian, Archimenid uh, Empire, which was the religion of Zoroastrian. That then collapsed in a bunch of smaller nation states. Then the Romans or the Hellenists or the Seleucid uh, Empire then consolidated everything. Then that collapsed into a bunch of smaller nation states. Then the Muslims conquered everything with the caliphates. That thing collapsed uh, with, into smaller nation states. Then the Huns and Mongols came in, uh, took everything, and then that ended up collapsing. Uh, and the same type of pattern of consolidate, collapse, consolidate, collapse occurred uh, in the East with the dynasties, the lords in the West, the Tsars in Russia, as well as the kingdoms in Africa and America. You can see it from this video, The History of the World Every Year. Uh, and just a little bit of uh, background, uh, Persia, the paper also refers to Arabia, Asia and Persia. They're all different areas. Persia is kind of between Arabia and India. It's all the stans. Uh, Arabia is between Egypt or Africa and then uh, Persia uh, and Asia's east, like India and east uh, in terms of kind of the different the, differences there. And another important distinction before we go into the meat of this paper is the difference between race and stock. Uh, race is not to be confused with ethnicity. Race is a, a uh, social cultural term and includes uh, patterns of behavior and mimetic, not just genetic factors. So pretty much any demographic cluster is considered a race. Uh, so even, you know, through empires, uh, you have different races kind of battling it out and then there could be interbreeding between different uh, races and then that will form a new race. It's not just genetically, but also mimetically. Um, so, alrighty, uh, gonna re-enable, yep, Kelly's. Yeah, there's just a bit of uh, white noise when 
on your microphone for some reason. I can't. All so, right. Hmm. So that's why I had sure. you disabled. Uh, so we've got um, a big overview of kind of what the text kind of goes into. I can probably read through that if you want, uh, Kelly, and then we can go into the more interesting discussion points that I think we can add a lot into. Well, we can really have to, we can just go directly for the text <clears throat> Yeah. the stages. So, yeah. So, uh, the kind of the point of the paper by Sir John Glubb uh, is to kind of instill the idea of different ages of an empire. So it starts off with the age of resolution. Uh, this is one that I've kind of cataloged because he was, it seemed a little bit rushed. It could have been for it. He, sometimes he kind of overlaps them or distincts or uh, doesn't make them as distinct as they could. Or sometimes later he would make them kind of distinct. So. What I've been able to abstract from the paper are the following. So there's the age of resolution, uh, which is kind of happens through revolution and internal conquest. So you have all this intra competition, then you eventually end up with a resolution from it. So it's kind of categorized by intolerance to the weak, eradication of the weak, and then achievement of racial homogeny and unification. It virtues around strength, honor, duty, and camaraderie. Then there's the age of expansion or the age of outbursts, or, which is categorized by external conquest. There's a national self confidence a fervor, uh, and the ability to reconcile, assimilate, and appropriate over the bickering and weak conquers. Uh, let me see if I can. I wonder where this background noise. Okay. Oh, okay. If I make your microphone a bit. Yeah, that's more tolerable. Alrighty. Um, and you can still talk. So, all right. The age of expansion. Uh, so it also brings incredible wealth and opportunity and direction everywhere it touches. So this is when we see that consolidation. So you have a bunch of nation states and that's consolidated into a unified uh, homogeneity or unified race. So mimetic, not so much necessarily genetic. Um, however, the Genghis Khan thing, there was rape and pillaging and extinguishment of the men. So to some extent, there was uh, genetic conquering there, but it doesn't need to be a genetic. So once you've been able to unify all these nations into a big empire, then you bring upon the age of commerce. So trade now turns into wealth. Uh, so new trade by the expanse uh, conquered diversity of previous weak nations. So that brings forth innovation as well as appropriation. And it improves on the prior structures of the previous uh, conquering tribe. Now they're able to take forth and, and innovate and uh, trade and expand their commerce. That then brings forth the age of affluence. Uh, money turns into the culture. So reaping of the seed of rewards, incredible wealth from homogenizing the fruits of the previous dystopia. Immigration into the cities by foreign entrepreneurs and local entrepreneurs wanting cheap foreign labor, uh, which is kind of the modern day diversity of recruitment that we're seeing today in the West. Uh, and also upper class is the mode of imitation direction. So people will kind of look to the upper class and want to imitate it. Then that follows on into the age of intellect, where greed turns into training. So now we establish universities, we train people to pursue careers that will return the most money, uh, rather than necessarily being focused about, you know, virtues of being great citizens and great people. It's just about how to fulfill the roles in the economy. So the nation reshapes its culture around greed and fame. National racial God is swapped for the globalist God of money. Borders become abstractions rather than practicalities. Intellectual distancing from the past to maintain a former nobility against declining moral standards. There's a false belief that intellect agreement can solve all problems and men become less manly. So there's a more feminization of the culture. Then that leads forth into the age of affluenza. Uh, frivolity turns into degeneracy. Uh, he calls this the high noon period. So the nation becomes bored. Empathy expands beyond interests of their own race. So cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan, which is kind of open borders, open migration uh, and welfare kind of get introduced. Each empire views its arrival as the ultimate virtue, yet it still falls. And people blame the spending, uh, like the ruin of the empire, the collapse of the empire and the rich, uh, but not necessarily the welfare state, which is actually spending more. Um, we also see this empathetic expansion with veganism in the modern era. Uh, where because of supermarkets now we don't have the necessity to kill for nutrition. Uh, 
so we can avoid some unnecessary cruelty and that's just another area of ex expanding uh, empathy or even like with owning pets just because they're cute uh, that's another example um, but the welfare state is a good example so people become coddled uh, and bickering and differences over trivial matters exemplifies there's a focus on faux games so entertainment faux heroes celebrities he documents this in the chapter the arab decline when and uh this is also tied into other works by other authors so when external predators become eliminated uh then the species hypersexualizes so so uh, intra like mate competition now becomes the only natural pressure because there's no more a natural selective pressure evolutionary speaking from predators once predators are gone then it's only competition for who reproduces that kind of becomes the only game left uh in the age of affluenza uh so optimizations dissipate and sexual inequality ensues so you have a few alter ultra mates mating with everybody and then most people aren't actually reproducing um there's a traveler who traveled the entire world uh called ibn batul Batuta, Batuta, uh, back nearly a thousand years ago. Uh, and he really traveled quite far. And there's a little quote in uh, a bit which he talked about where he said uh, he was kind of shocked. Uh, yeah, among the Turks and Mongols, he was astonished at the freedom and respect enjoyed by women and remarked that on seeing a Turkish couple in a bazaar, one might assume that the man was the woman's servant when he was in fact her husband he also so uh, and then he also uh he felt that dress customs in the maldives and some sub-saharan regions in africa were too revealing uh and then a quote within the book that we're reading today uh or have you know discussing today soon after this period government and public order collapsed and foreign invaders overran the country the resulting increase in confusion and violence made it unsafe for women to move unescorted in the streets with the result that this feminine feminist movement collapsed so the idea here is uh the nation kind of becomes safe uh and then once it becomes safe then the necessity to protect women from vicious males decreases uh so then women can enjoy freedom uh but then uh that is then taken for granted and those borders of homogeny of safety and culture that maintains that safety collapses and things become unsafe again uh, the other issue is with the economy, you have nepotistic wealth structures, they kind of become concretized uh, and uh, inequality increases despite raising tides. So despite the quality of life increasing, uh, the inequality between the poor and the rich continues to, to expand. This then leads to the age of decline. Nihilism turns into despair, which turns into terrorism. National pessimism pursues. Races battle with each other again. Uh, this is kind of considered subcultures which we've discussed in other uh in other discussions uh discontent turns into interstate warfare instead of solidarity to threat tribalism doubles down to assert claims of dominance this is kind of interesting because a lot of the liberal necessity in propaganda is the quest for unity and uh solidarity and you can look to someone's politics or their propaganda to kind of be like what they think they need. Uh, so conservatives generally think they need closed borders because they maintain a great uh, community. Uh, whereas liberals, they want unity and solidarity uh, because they don't particularly have it. Uh, so it's kind of uh, interesting there where instead of uh, actually achieving solidarity, that doesn't end up happening instead uh, tribalism just continues despite calls for solidarity. And so the key points of these ages is a new cycle doesn't need to come from within. Uh, so once an empire collapses, it doesn't necessarily be revitalized from within. Often an external predator eliminates that nation or revitalizes that nation. And existing kingdoms don't need to be inferior in all areas. They just need to be susceptible to a military takeover. Uh, so often, once they go into the age of intellect, they defund uh, kind of defensive measures and then they become vulnerable to military exploitation. And then military exploitation is vicious for a very short period of time. 
and then they kind of reclaim all the uh, benefits of the intellectual period anyway. So one has to continue to maintain strong defenses. Um, and so in today, we see this kind of with the China's uh, the People's Republic of China versus Taiwan and Hong Kong, as well as Myanmar and Burma, uh, as of 2021 with Burma. Uh, the military uh, just did another seizure uh, over their uh, supposed democracy. Uh, and now we'll go into like an open-ended uh, discussion. Kelly, is there anything you want to add? Oh, yes, I'm still here. I'm just listening to your marvelous voice. <laughs> Alrighty. Uh, well, I'll go into the discussion points and then chime in when you are when you're ready. So, uh, so right now I see several parallels. Well, well, we, can, to, we can go there. Yeah. China and US. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Sorry, China and US. It's a good observation, but I think the yeah. the Chinese new empire started in 1950, let's say, and uh, take roughly 250 years. Or if you, if you like, take the numbers that he puts in the paper and you make an average, it's gonna be like 238 or something. And um, that would be that would be 2,200, which will be the end of Chinese empire of current iteration. An American one, if we consider 7076, it would be 2016, 2024, 2016, which is something some, well something we notice nowadays with the rise of a different um, how do you say uh, moralistic uh, views on, on on how the things are. Uh, can you can you bring the can you bring the data, data points back? The, the page yep. with data points. And so what's happening now, for example, is that uh, America and China have different uh, prerogatives. For example, the, the the Chinese nowadays, they they don't care about, for example, IP laws or patents. They just blatantly copy stuff and illegally produce. They don't give a shit. They just want to do it and they will do it them because they achieved a level of military power that prevents a land invasion. And the other thing is um, the, the, only, the only new condition in, in the age of empires is the nuclear weaponry. And I'm thinking whether, because nuclear weaponry prevents a less takeover by a foreign nation. So my question is, uh, so because normally in the last stage, what we have is like external takeover, that's what happens. And with, with, nu with nukes, uh, external takeover is not really possible because it's a mutual annihilation and it's a game nobody wants to play. So what will happen is that uh, technical, uh, you can call it purgatory, where things continue uh, because nobody comes to take over an internal resolution, or they can be fragmentation, uh, but then it will be small states with nuclear uh, cap nuclear capacity, so it doesn't really change anything. So um, that is an important point to consider when, when we compare, for example, China as a new empire compared to US, um, because before you didn't have nuclear capability in previous cases, in all of the previous um, so that's so that's a bit different there. Um, other than that, um, I don't know. Uh, it, 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 it covers pretty well almost everything here. Let me let me see some of my notes. For example, the state school. Uh, 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 yes, no, this is the state school stuff. The reason for invasion. There was one note which is very important. Um, which was, um, yes, the, uh, uh, yes, plunder and rape, and the other was um, it's, it's things are in the old empire, and many of the revolution at the time was loot, plunder, and rape. And, and uh, it was built on the history of, of, well, of China um, over long periods of time. And uh, so, so they have this emergence, and I would start that right now they're they're in the state of the they're in the age of commerce they're 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 moving from age of conquest to age of commerce and like slowly moving to the age of affluence where they have the political ability to project their power abroad and at the same time they have these Confucian institutes in the West where they put all of their students who are also some sometimes spying while working for different Western companies for the government and and leak useful information be it some uh, advancement, uh, tech advancement or whatever. But also should they accumulate knowledge in the agreement that that is the that is the next stage, the age of intellect, which they will come probably like in the next 50 years, it will start 
being more obvious after they reach the affluence because it will happen. The issue is here is that the affluence per se originally will not be of the same kind because of the nuclear nukes there there a thing that changed the uh, changes the name of the game there is a nice book by his name is uh, uh, Hayes and the book is called the psychology of nuclear proliferation and um, um, it, it just uh, discusses the 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 well the behavior that uh, different actors have due to the capacity of having nuclear weaponry and how it prevents to have convention Conventional warfare or conventional overtakes, you will not have somebody overtaking you militarily. It will be a high price to pay, which they cannot make because it will be self destructive to invade, which is great defense. While societies become more defensive at the last stages, they, they, technically they become impossible to invade because their defense is your absolute destruction. And so these nations, I think they will be like nation purgatory. Which will boil until they either fragment, still nuclear, or or what will happen is that uh, out of the internal turmoil they will come out again uh, and, and re-emerge. And since well, I mean we're living in exciting times because the, the empire is following the the all of, all of the all of the stages stage does not will not be fulfilled, you know. So is it going to continue perpetually, or will there be some resurgence of, um, in in terms of uh, I don't know some intellectual advancement or whatever so things you notice that is what happens is basically well you conquer everything it's it's a rich kid it's called a rich kid rich kid problem is that is that the parents did all the they had all the struggle they, they did all the experimentation they found how things work and then they made all the earnings and their influential parents and then they have kids and the kids can just talk all uh, and nothing because they're so smart and they're well educated and they go to um, expensive universities sometimes good universities sometimes not the same thing and but the thing is they're highly decadent because they don't there is no struggle and what, what do, and lack of struggle is what uh, ego suffering and ego suffering is what well it's like well i have to make up shit to feel good about myself because there is no it's a search for meaning after all and uh, if they don't have a struggle they will have to make up struggles and you may you know imagine the same case but on a national level like uh, millions of people uh, not having things to struggle about the, the real important things so they go for the smallest petty things that they can find in, uh, to try to fix them and then of course, and then of course they, they start also on top of things which were not an issue whatsoever but uh, to make them an issue they have to uh, destroy uh, considerations of the past upon which those issues were born or uh, which sorry which does not make it an issue and so what happens is that they destroy that and how do they destroy they, they, they dismantle it by developing a methodology of thinking which allows them to uh, outright reject something it doesn't have to be valid to be um, it doesn't have to have proof it has to be good enough to be accepted as a meaningful activity to generate struggle and that is what well technically post 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 structuralism is what it was because um, the French guys, um, they were like, they were the so-called feds and they felt uh, bad, but they cannot really achieve much. Imagine imagine you come into a field where everything was already achieved, like there is a lot of work to do just to achieve a very little. And this is a, a horrible payoff matrix. You know, you have to put like a hundred hours, I mean, to write one book after a hundred books is very different than book, you know, and it's like, what are I going to do? And so he's like, nah, all hundred books were wrong. And you don't really explain how you keep it vague, you keep it obscure, uh, and it kind of makes sense, but not really. And you just bore people out of it. And and that is why that is why this thing is so popular. This thing is so popular because there's no struggle. And so the few things, the small things which are troublesome, will be solved. But the problem is, is that they're easy to solve, and it, and it happens generally fast. So you need to go after big things, but big things are kind of solved. So we. The thing which solved the big thing, and we say, nah, that thing is wrong because the big thing is actually not. And proof or not proof, uh, you go for the basics, and the basics is epistemology, the basics is axiomatic principles, and you say, nah, it's all wrong, it doesn't make sense. Uh, the method which you use to make those axioms, logic does not exist, you know, we have because you have to reject that which solves the problem because then you cannot solve the problem because it was already solved, but that which you criticize, and you have to destroy it. 
and and that is the this is the last ages, uh, um, which are very different from the first ages. People are just so busy. It's like it's like either fight or flight. Uh, sorry, no, it's a fight or die. And in China, it's like this: we either work ridiculous hours for 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 like nothing, or or well, or we don't go, don't get anywhere. People do exactly that, and they don't care about IP. Again, they don't care about IP loss. They do whatever they want for for the end. Mm, there is a higher social mobility because there is still a uh, 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 capacity. Have this nepotic uh, elite hasn't uh, been uh, found yet. It will take them probably a hundred years. But China will have exactly what we have here in the West, uh, and it will be exactly the same progress we have bankers and. And a corporate elite because they're all friends, they're all relatives, well, most of them, a lot of them relatives. Mm, it, it, the structure. And they just keep to themselves because they just want to secure the, their if affluence, they want to secure their uh, commercial success, they want to secure their capacity. Uh, it's asymmetric information. It's the, pur the purpose is to retain ignorant population so that you can retain your well your influence. And Lime, uh, when that was a portion, we had French Revolution because French Revolution was exactly. That when, when what, uh, like ninety percent of French population? No, yeah, ninety percent of French population almost no land, and all land was controlled by like what, uh, seven or eight percent of people or something like that, now, who are mainly aristocracy, and so off with their heads, and so it was. I mean, it's a natural problem, and people, people in different topic topics in different areas uh, feel about this. It's the natural. Inequality. The thing is, the more productive you get, or the better outcomes, the easier it gets to get to the near stage. And the, sh and the worse the situation is for you, the harder it will be for you to prevent it getting worse and worse. And that is that's called the natural inequality. And as I as had previous talk, if you remember, that's where we mentioned the difference between the, the socialism and and capitalism. If you try to answer to the same problem in two different ways, but the solution is to the same problem nonetheless, or the offered solution. And the thing is, they both have negative and positive outcomes. The problem is that uh, um, who are mostly unaware of their actions generally, they will just uh, go with the thinking action whether they should do something. And generally that leads to uh, of the ways of thinking, of the structures they inhabit, because, um, because especially the biological predispositions Imperatives of survival, they they uh, overshadow their thinking in general. So it introduces better tribes in an structures, but there is social mobility whatsoever, regardless the uh, or ideology that is in place. And uh, well, he he does an excellent description of the situation. So, yeah, <laughs> people become very. Very soft over times. Uh, it, it's a rich kid, and a rich kid problem is just of empire, because it's the same on the micro parents who had it tough, and they managed to also also through luck, and and they had great success, and because of that they're popular, they're influential, and then and then the kids have to achieve not everything. All they have to do is just spend time thinking and having fun, which is being uh, what being pernicious. <laughs> Wasting, wasting your time basically on, on meaningless things because you you can have it all um, in monetary terms because it allows you to, it's basically freedom uh, allows you to have an immense amount of freedom. But the problem with freedom is that you don't know what to do with all that freedom, and and that's an issue that people haven't learned to deal with. What to do with all the freedom? Like if you don't have struggle, and generally the less struggles you have, the more freedom you have, and that's that's the payoff. Uh, and um, what happens with people is that. Uh, they they find out that okay I cannot really mm, go anywhere and so and so even unconsciously it's very uncomfortable feeling meaninglessness so nihilism uh, dystopian view of the world uh, dy dystopian view of the world is not necessarily coming together with nihilism the point of dystopian view of the world by the people in the late stages of empires which is like in the US the purpose is to is to say that things are bad because things going bad is good and it's good because there will be struggle and struggle is meaningful and for that reason dystopia is important so in fact people who can be highly unaware of what they do they can promote dystopian um, or, or push for dystopian uh, ways of being our dystopian society because uh, 
multiple crises that come out of that structural crisis. Uh, we would be excellent um, fuel for for mean and and creation of solution struggle struggle and um is people who i'm talking because that's another part of the age of everybody talks it's like we are talking a lot now nobody we're not going out somewhere and doing something we're not actively chasing down bankers we're not actively chasing down somebody who has immense wealth we're just talking about how bad they are and that's the age of intellect that is what we are especially in the west we're having this and that well it doesn't change because everybody's confused, like, yay, it's not great, it could have been better, but what we have is just fine compared to survival. And so why not uh, Why not just keep it that way? But the thing is, um, is that, uh, yes, it is not bad, or, or, uh, more so, it's, it's, it's good, but uh, the situation is temporary. And it is temporary because uh, society um, uh, as, as a whole, um, clustered by, by classes, let's say, um, especially the, the, the wealth classes the the upper ones uh, aggregate uh, faster and faster uh, the wealth and the thing is is that they're uh, the other thing that they that you have to, their thinking is also affected by that process but in a different way because they have everything they also have meanings and so they seek to, to uh, meaning in more exaggerated and more outlandish thing which a so-called normal or average person will never engage into because they think it's outrageous mm. but so that's why you have the that's why you have the uh, how do you say it, the concept of a weird billionaire who has a weird hobby and uh, manifestations of their lack of struggle and they're just looking for something to be more meaningful and the problem here becomes when, uh, with the uh, with the perception that that the wealthy ones have uh, over everybody else because wealth allows you to see no struggle and you're uh, the problem is that freedom is you don't know what to do with it because um meaning was in the struggle not in freedom the goal was freedom the meaning was in the struggle uh, so you create your own struggle or or well or you just um how it, drown yourself in uh, in sodomy and something like that the other the other problem is that the psychological there was study um, um, if I could remember the study right now which mentions that or um, found out that even by absolute luck who who win uh, who's by arbitrary decision like throw the dice or somebody decides arbitrarily that, uh, that uh, they win something it means that they're better than their opponent that they're more skilled and talented and that has nothing to do with luck that has to do with their innate abilities and there was a name for this uh, way of thinking but it, it comes from the it, it is an it is an ego and it's a survival tactic of our brain to tell us that uh, you, it will not be easily taken because you have control over this it is important to have control over things because again this order here is important to remember and so mind wants you to be to wants to have ordered behavior and or ordered psyche and so you cannot think that your uh, success and achievement is even in part uh, by accident because it is by accident just as by accident or by arbitrary means just just as it came to you it can easily and you have no control over it and it, a horrible realization to have. and so uh, well our brains choose not to and they tell us not to and the study what they study found it was I think kids playing Monopoly, and they have found that those who win or those who lose think they're better off, although it was absolutely arbitrary the way they were winning, and and they become more obnoxious, they become more uh, domine, domine, domineering, they feel more confident um, as a result. And now imagine exactly that for people who have absolute control over politics, business, wealth, and it's a network of them. They 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 consider themselves gods not because I. You envy them, or because I think so, but because the sheer volumes and the, really, the sensation that you have from having such an experience is well, amazingly gratifying, but also highly nihilistic. Nothing matters, so everything is permissible, and mm, because everything is permissible, that is why you have politicians who do uh, how does it, uh, hypocritical actions. They don't care because they can do everything, and the chances of them getting in trouble are minimal they have such good grasp on politics on people on the general public that they know how to not get in trouble by doing whatever they want and they create structures be it legislative structures be it uh, well generalist legislative structure be it um 
ideological academic that allows them to retain this hold um, and bathe in ego. It's it's ego hubris it's temporary hubris but uh, what happens eventually is that th due to such a um, concentration uh, because what we have is centralization of wealth and power in the west regardless how democratic we see it not because people cannot vote but because the vote of people is meaningless and uh, people thinking that they have any decision on politics uh, is, 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 is well, it's a lie. It's no longer truth. So they vote, and they vote the way they were influenced to vote. They, it was not a critical thinking uh, in terms of okay, I, well, this politician says this, and this one, this is this, and uh, seeing how these politicians have been doing in the past, and that they follow up. Then problem is, I probably should vote for this one. Maybe I should vote for this one, or maybe altogether I should vote for another party. Uh, they don't go through this. It's it's all about. Feelings is about uh, sensationalism. It's about emotional output. Mm, there is no uh, consideration of thinking whatsoever. And so, what happens is that uh, centralized wealth, centralized int intellectualism. Uh, so, so uh, be it technological like Silicon Valley that dominates not only U.S. but uh, almost the world um, through through the means of um, social media and platforms. And have acad academia, of course, uh, and well, business. That's another one. Um, I mean, it's just it just my, the amount of things which are related and how they operate with one another at the same time to levels uh, is mind boggling. And so, just try to keep all of that in mind. Uh, the, it's like it's like a huge it's like a huge model, and every part in the model moves, and uh, they move in. A different way, of course, based on interaction with one another, and so you start seeing this huge image, which is made small parts, uh, which are tiny parts, such as your family structure and and what what are the family roles nowadays in your society, to the the levels of what the legislation does and how the governments are propped and how they make decisions and what is the essence of the governments, to how businesses are organized and what consumer. Um, consumer means uh, a person is a consumer. What it means to be a consumer. These are different things which are all connected and they all shuffle. And the problem is the problem is here in the West is that we have the decadence. We we slowly shifted from age of intellect, which ended somewhat like I don't know, maybe eighties, nineties, and we're slowly ended roughly. You cannot say that, but um, it's more. It becomes less prevalent, and, and decadence becomes more prevalent. And we have. Say, Sexualization. We have we have we have the 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 topics of drag, especially in US is a great example. Drag queen. Like why is it becomes more politicized? Uh, there is nothing left to be political about. Uh, that's uh, solving or or it there is, but people are distracted because distracted from that because that will jeopardize the people at the upper levels to do what the hell they want so it's just more it has it you're at the top and you and your life is kind of meaningless so you do what the hell you want because nothing really matters and is that um, you, you don't want to you don't you still don't want to suffer so in, in fact your struggle your struggle is against the people who you're supposed to serve or or who on whom you depend in terms of business let's say so you're a politician or businessman and, and um, your struggle then becomes your survival. Survival from being caught. You're not caught uh, is important, and that can be so in this warped way, in this like very like uh, uh, mental way. The purpose of you you uh, gives you meaning because uh, because it's a struggle to not get hanged, tried, killed, or or elected. Um, you name it or getting your business or this man or whatnot executed. And that's a struggle to not do that. To not do that, you have to do something which will make people want to do that to you. And this is like such a mental case that, I mean, it's a it's a warped psyche. People are just, uh, because what, what is, think of it like this. There is a labyrinth, right? And at the end of labyrinth, the exit is just a room. So you so the exit you exit, into 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 a room of four walls. So the only way out of the labyrinth is back into the labyrinth. Okay. So now imagine you you, you go through the labyrinth all the way and you get to the room, and you and you and, and and as you go through the labyrinth, you get faster and faster because you're getting good at going through labyrinth. And at the end, you're like yeah, freedom. And you get in this huge hole and you start bouncing off walls and you realize there 
there's no exit. So what you do, you either return back. So you're 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 locked in this um, because we have not reached the, the levels where um, we are capable of developing more advanced forms of thinking or psychological thinking or psychological being. Mm. And so what happens is that you're locked within that which with, with which you were what that which was given to you and that with which you grew and that limit your progress forward and uh, you're generally unconscious of these um, mechanisms and what happens is that it gets it, it, you get into this when you start bouncing off so you start uh, it, it's it's a it's a psychotic almost uh, irritating effect because you realize i'm here i f i did the freaking labyrinth now what i'm locked in into this freaking room, what I do with it? And like, ah, it's rage. It's and so a lot of a lot of these people. Uh, if you've noticed, uh, so for example, there was a great example of this um, in my estimation is when Alex Jones, like uh, years after he went into Bohemian Grove, he caught one of the guys on the street, like he did, and those guys did, and that guy didn't know he was he was a politician or banker, I don't remember, and or lobby. And he, they were still on YouTube, and he didn't know that it was uh, Alex who was doing it. So he asked him question about the Bohemian Grove, and um, what do you think about people in interest and that. And that guy was like, something is fishing. He says, well, I, I filmed you. I, I was doing it. And that guy suddenly shows all the rage, like, how dare you? Like, you you had no right. And that. But that thing will give actually that man a meaning because, um, well. Um, it, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to be secretive. It's a struggle to prevent from losing wealth, influence, power over others. It doesn't mean that they're evil. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're wrong. wrong. Um, but why this dynamic is important? Just a small shower because I'm like going on a book here. But the dynamic is important for reasons is that it's a it's a structural issue. And is, is the mouse to go through the stages of empire uh, is the same mechanism which, when different variables in the empire in, in the process of, of development um, change what happens is that the original mechanism uh, warps its uh, essence because the variables which shaped its original essence changed and because of that it becomes different you you don't you it, it progresses from this survival pure survival mechanism where uh, everything matters and you have to make stern straight decisions right away it's us or or somebody else so we do it and they do it right and it goes to the stages where well we don't have to do this anymore because we have more wealth we already achieved these things so we're more calm we can ease off gas right and what happens like okay but the mechanism is still there so mechanism is like well what what what, what will i do it was a psychological mechanism here what will i do the mode of behavior mode of being what will i do if if now i have more wealth and i have more time hey i can actually pursue other things Things such as intellectual things and pyramid of Maslow comes here about self actualization because the theory, the, the, the seven stages of empire, sorry, six stages of them, the stages of empire, they're, they're very close pyramid of necessities and it's for security and safety are the first one and then and then you have uh, then you have something about, uh, let me see, I don't remember it right now, um, but the correlation is well the same pattern um, let me see and here uh, the issue here again it's it's simple there is a lot of struggle and then there is less struggle and then on small levels uh, intellectual family structures uh, work placement relationship between men and women relationship between kids and parents um, wealth differences um, sociality um, inequality quality structures, um, ability to achieve or, or not achieve uh, based on uh, opportunities, the saturation of the economy with the people who are taking everything. So like, uh, where I'm going to get a job? I can't get a job. Oh, there we go. So in this case, so physiological needs, yes, food, water, warmth, rest, and then security, safety. So, so, as you see, this is basically all. So survival is the strongest at the bottom, and, and as it is get satisfied, the upper layers of as a mechanism um, are actualized, which is self which ends in self actualization. So, like, well, prestige, feeling of accomplishment. You achieved something. You have success. Recognize you. Your achievement is struggle because, in fact, um, if you supersede something by sheer luck, talent, um, and in case of luck, we consider it our own talent and skill, because it is much better to consider. It's a cyclical uh, security. Psychological uh, necessity, um, and, and 
to be honest, it's kind of self. Uh, you can call it that way. And uh, what what happens is that uh, the steam is reached. So what's a, a billionaire, um, like uh, top dog? There is, like you can go anywhere in any industry because you have so much uh, wealth, uh, network, and and uh, support of the public. You can do pretty much anything. So what do you do? Huh? Where do you go? What what what, what do you do? <laughs> That's the question. And uh, I was like, like I, I do something, I, I fulfill my potential, you fulfill your potential. What, so basically, the stage of decadence is, is, is the, comes after self-actualization, because when society, um, as, as a big cluster, majority of the society becomes more uh, self-actualized, you have prestige or accomplishment because you have this academic degree. Now, it's not everybody, high school educated, everybody, or maybe is bachelor educated, for example. And, and a lot of masters and different digital programs and even there are small programs big programs is universe and, and that's another thing he talks about is the universities the universities appear in all towns small, small town big town doesn't matter there is a university in every town there stages of emphasis and so people's like well i get i get prestige earnings and the institutes try to gain prestige themselves and uh People, people get the the, the, the this sense of accomplishment. Oh, well, I, I finished this degree. Now I can go work and accomplish more. Nah, nah. And uh, the the thing is, is that then you try to self actualize yourself. And uh, the problem here is that not everybody is creative. And, and as we know, the creative live on the edge of edges of knowledge. The majority of people, well, overwhelming majority, of people are not creative. And uh, for that reason. Uh, they generally they generally uh, like slow down at the team stage of the of the muscle pyramid. If it's, so what happens is that well I have achieved the team everything and I cannot be really creative so I'm just gonna reinforce the last stage and so they do it they maximize the last stage they they actually accumulate huge amounts of wealth power influence huge amount of well. Uh, Respect uh, from from people and people on, and and what happens after that? Uh, right, so I just spend it because I cannot go further. Can be very creative and cre and do something and do it super unsurprisingly. So what do you do when the age of intellect uh, maxed out itself, or you're not under the age? Of intellect? You just, just like well, I must. Spend. And the rise of something like uh, material that happens because like well i have all of this thing that i accumulated how can i expand it so that i uh, can exchange all of these goodies for for my for myself and enjoy and enjoy and uh, that's called commodification economy which is what happening nowadays in the west for the last like 60 years uh, is that you're trying to commodify anything anything you know you can you can even freaking commodify feelings. How do you do that? You have these videos of, it's called mukbang, which is uh, Koreans eating Korean food. It's a table full of dishes and people eat and there's like, mm, and they chew and they, and they like uh, express their sensations. They're commodifying feeling and you pay or with ads or by giving them Patreon donations, pay for watching to watch people feel something. You can commodify feelings nowadays. You can commodify accomplishments, right? I reached this and like, if you want, if you want to know more, you can send to my Patreon account, or you can send, or you can send to my PayPal, or you name it, right? And and you can. This is this is that which you accumulated, you know, spend, because you cannot go further into being creative. And there is a degree of creati creativity with it, but overwhelmingly creative people are rare. They're probably like one to one to four five percent of the world population. It's very little. So what happens when majority of people uh, uh, maximize themselves? on the esteem stage right uh, they think they well, they can self-actualize themselves so they have these weird hobbies they pay for uh, all kind of uh, horseback riding uh, snorkeling with sharks uh, jumping off the cliff you name it they pay for all of this because they accumulated all of that wealth and wealth not only like monetary wealth but also intellectual wealth or anything that can be sold and commodified or exchange uh, for what you actually looking for for and and so we keep spending it over and then created my need for this and this and this but anything they're just consuming uh, the products of others in exchange uh, of what they offer themselves and now imagine uh, being on the 
upper levels of that. And the thing is, is that most people are more at the bottoms, uh, and and there and and the rise happens. This this is the social mobility. Now, when social mobility reduces, the capacity to rise higher in the muscle hierarchy uh, decreases. So you cannot rise higher, or it is very hard. Because you cannot, you need to be show letters, especially the wealth, one, uh, the monetary wealth one, to be able to exchange, commodify yourself, uh, to to well, sell your labor or work for somebody. So they pay you money, so they can you can do things which you want to self actualize and So you have a hobby that you need. You need a job to pay for that hobby. You know, uh, that is the mindset. But the thing is, as 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 inequality, especially monetary increases, so does access to the capacity decreases uh, for losses and it, it is more centralized and concentrated at upper minority. And this is natural quality. We have both capitalism and socialism, but the thing is, it doesn't work in the long term, personally in med um, short or medium term, which is like what, uh, 200 years. That's not very long. What do you do with thousands, potentially thousands of years? So you're perpetually running 100 years, revolutions, capitalism, socialism, and, or you can use more rudimentary forms of capitalism, which was mercantilism, or before it, it was uh, well, feudal, well, feudalism is technically more socialist than, than capitalism. If I'm not mistaking anything, Correct. these uh, socialism is nothing new. It is it is it is a old uh, it is a new iteration of, of old ideas, the inequality distribution. Um, and, uh, the technical progress uh, allowed us to, to glimpse a bit far behind it. But to be able to solve it, uh, it, it, it that, is why, that is why, for example, Marx, let's take Marx, it's a great example. He's one of the most, if not the most cited um, person on the planet uh, in terms of academic papers. This, uh, his critic, late 19th century capitalism at the time, is, is superb. The problem is his solutions. Uh, so criticizing is easy. That's the one thing because you can find flaws and you can say oh, this doesn't work this way, and there is validity. To that the problem is coming with solutions to those critiques, and that takes a lot of creativity. That takes a lot of testing. That a lot of thinking, and it doesn't just happen to be like, well, we can just do if we just do this, this, and this. And so what happens? A frenzy of experimentation, and then the world falls into experimentation. And the 20th century um, is is dictated by by people who are experimenting. With with the with the with the criticism and it's like well we can do this and then you have surges of socialist nations around the world and everybody tries and they keep failing and failing and failing because surprisingly finding solutions to the critiques which can be valid is not the same and it's very very difficult so just something and it's like yeah oh, we can just develop a new system out from the ground it's like no that will not work and that's why these states keep failing and failing because you cannot just ignore original things although it gives also it is very meaningful to do that because there is now suddenly a lot of struggle that you have to deal with you know uh, but it's temporary temporary as in people fall into the modes of being they had before and the, the whole, then you realize that solving the issue is not as easy as criticizing it now, some people don't even realize it and so there was no, not real socialism as an example at the same time what happens is that capital is changing and emerging and so critique has to adapt to the difference of it uh, but one criticizes the other and vice versa, uh, in, the, in whether they realize it or not, in mass, be it academic circles, be it, be it, be it politicians trying to get some clout of actions or ability to do their authoritarian thinking without without much of a you know, without much of a counter arguments uh, from the general public. But the issue here is that they cannot they cannot just uh, disengage from it uh, consciously. A lot of these processes are many of these processes are unconscious, uh, collectively unconscious. Uh, here we have a little, little bit of Jung. Mm, and uh, they, people act upon the fear of them. And so, so, and so they're not aware of the, the way they exist, which they do. And it is very hard with rationalization sometimes. Oh, I do this or oh, I do that. Um, and it can be damaging to the ego because again, survival mechanism prevents you from thinking that you are talented, you are skillful, you can do it. And then somebody comes, hey, you're, what, you've do, you, what you're doing has been done before. You want to try something else, but trying something else is difficult and it's not arbitrary, it requires creativity, it requires skill, it requires talent. And if you don't have any, it puts you in a point where you have to contrast reality of what you have to do with your 
your innate capacities or accumulated capacities to do it. And that is uncomfortable situation to be. So you reject that. And you say, no, 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 it was not real. It was not real socially, not real. it's not real. Uh, or you have on the right side, you have it or right side, capitalist side, you have, it's not real capitalism, for example, or capitalism is warped, which is also true. But this is this is the mechanism which which prevents people to to see not rationally but to to be conscious, be aware of that which they do. You don't. It's not about being smarter or capacity to develop actions just by preventing doing that which already been done. Aware of what you're actually doing uh, is a huge advantage on the individual level or on society. Level now the thing is is like when you have a lot of struggle it's super easy because if you ignore reality you're done okay so societies at the first stages of empires like stages of pioneers and conquests they know like if it's not us we're screwed like if I don't do this now I'm done but uh, and and I have to think ahead because there are possible situations which will jeopardize my progress so I have to um, hedge those pro problems too hedge those situations too. Uh, and I have to do it now. But at the at the last stages, the age of decadence or intellect, what happens? Like, yeah, we don't have to do. We don't have to rush anywhere, you know. And so we can take time. Let's talk about it. No, no, no. Let's meditate about it. Let's think around. Let let, let it float, you know. And nobody nobody thinks uh, nobody thinks in the same terms. And because this urgency for survival uh, makes people blind to the reality uh, and to discrepancies between who they are and and what things are and what things are becoming and it and so uh, it's it's a, it's it's like being drunk and uh, and my understanding is that lack of struggle uh, which which dis disengages uh, let's say lower stages of survival mechanism uh, lack of struggle makes you blind to the issues which keep crippling up because there are still issues and the upper layers of your survival are still there but you can't really Really satisfy them and it is a struggle so in fact there is a struggle for search of meaning and isn't it the name of the paper search for survival that's a funny part because the struggle you can find struggle itself in finding solution to the issue of not being able to go further beyond the stages of esteem or stages of self-actualization self for example go beyond stage of uh, age of decadence in the empire that is a huge struggle but people are not even aware of that because uh, first of all you have to be aware of of that struggle existing and because they're unaware they just acted out without knowing and so history keeps repeating itself over and over again because they're unaware that they keep repeating and they're aware the struggle is real and for me uh, for example the meaning or meaningful thing to be to do is to develop or find out further stages or develop awareness among the people of of this issue of issue that in socialism capitalists can solve it is it is not only philosophical it's also a psychological issue um, and that that uh, survive that your biology drives and and, and your psychology uh, concurs uh, and keeps reproducing without you being aware of it. People don't realize this is a struggle developing it. And so for the elites, I have exactly the same thing. Hey, spend all your money on on, on defining ways or financing ways which allow you to have um, to have um, developed solutions for, for this problem. Because it is a problem, it is a struggle. People are not even aware of it. It's a higher order struggle. It's a, you can call it meta struggle. That I'd guarantee you 99% of the world is not aware. Probably probably like a few thousand people are aware of this plan because they have thought and were able to disassociate themselves and accumulate enough. I'm just lambasting about myself, how, how, how smart and great I am here. But it's like, it, it took me it took me a while to realize these things. You, 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 you like, after maybe 100 or 150 of meaningful books like about this, this, the systems, the structure, of systems and how societies work, a bit of psychology and, um, and economics and the political structure. You see the connections and you see how thing influences the other, you know. And all of a sudden, you, you see you see the picture bigger and bigger, more detailed picture. And it's like, oh, I see the labyrinth, I see the room. Because uh, what happens, like people don't know the room, they just see the labyrinth. And it's like, okay, now I have to fill the, I have to pass the labyrinth of life. Let's say, labyrinth is complex because the straight is not the sorry the. The root is not straight. It's 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 influenced by by external factors, which changes the direction. Which is basically what it. That is why this, the the labyrinth is curved, uh, and uh, or has corners. But uh, at the same time, I'm, I'm trying to articulate here an idea. And don't uh, I'm, I think I'm doing it much justice. But the other idea, that, that that articulation is that that curviness is not only of your own making. So you actually influence the labyrinth. Uh, 
by making it curvy. So your limitations is what makes it curvy, but also external limitations is what makes it curvy. Okay, you try to pass that labyrinth, and the better you get at it, the the straighter becomes the labyrinth. The less the less turns there are, okay, and from from your own and from outside perspective, there are less turns. And so you and so the end of the labyrinth is just a straight line, and the straight line into nothingness. No, the straight line leads to this room. Uh, it, it's the ceiling. It's the developmental ceiling of humanity, basically. That's what I'm trying to say. At the end of the labyrinth, and within that, you hit that ceiling and you bounce back. No, no, no. You because they do not know what can be outside. But this ceiling is the struggle. You have to break the ceiling, not uh, be stuck under it. You know, and that is the meta meaning that I think will be possible potential solution to to the issue of uh, what's after self actualization, what is after uh, age of decadence, because in fact it requires volumes of creative creative thinking to and and hypothesis testing and the theoretical testing uh, on practical in practical terms, which require a lot of money and a lot of people who will do small cognitive the machine type of activities that will allow us to find out uh, upper but um, your you are very rich or you're very poor is that uh, the upper the upper layer um, lack of meaning is is not true because the meaning is there the lack of meaning is the uh, and for First of all, the problem is that people aren't aware of their social standing, uh, and the second of it is that, uh, well, they try to make up things uh, with where what they're. Doing. They kind of feel that well, I'm at the top and there is nothing that really matters, you know. So what do I get to do? And then they do whatever they want, and they try to secure that, and it creates all kind of negative externalities. It damages the structure of society as a whole. It starts to be fractured. It starts to be genius. Uh, has to be more fluid, and then they get they get overwhelmed by the by the by more structured society, which is the external factor. But nukes prevent this. So uh, my understanding is that nukes is a good thing because it allows the nations which are entering the last stage, like United States, it allows them to go to the next stage. I'm hypothesizing here, but the next stage uh, will be what the stage of meaning, I guess, or stage of uh, well, perpetual perpetual progress I, I call it I, um, infinite I call it infinite aware pragmatism uh, and, and it relates to a book by by James Carson I think I mentioned it in another talk um, finite and infinite games and the concept don't don't look at, at something like he he's his you know, way of thinking is a bit um, incomplete let's say he's not wrong but he's incomplete and James Cars he was better at it uh, where he was described it's called finite and infinite games. In, if you add to this the capacity for conscious or conscious observation, so of being aware of something, um, so you have, have finite players and you have infinite players. And the finite players, uh, they they play within the rules, so within the order. They are generally the non-creative people. The creative people are the infinite ones. They're generally more intelligent and average. They're and they're a minority. And what happens is that infinite players don't play within the boundaries. They play with the. They're not nihilistic. Uh, they're more well. I can experiment with it. It's not that nothing really matters, but that more like everything matters in terms of um, me able to play with everything, like um, the rule thing. But rules are more of guidelines rather than strict, rigid limitations. You know, and there is also a difference in personalities which we have in conservatives and liberals because the more liberal types, the more infinite, or they should be more infinite, and, and conservatives are more finite limited mindsets where they have a, and we're traditionalists and we have limitations and what happens is that um, the, the 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 situation of cooperation uh, oh, interesting interesting that you, uh, cooperation and cheating uh, it comes to the realization that um, cooperation as a as a maximizing uh, process is more important than than competition the competition uh, considers everything a zero sum game so if I win you lose and if you you lose, I win. I do sixty, you do four, do sixty, because then it's non-zero sum game. And uh, in, in reality, things are non-zero sum games. There are very few zero sum games, and they're generally very limited. Like football game, it's a zero sum game. Um, uh, although the, the although the the scoreboard of the football game is a non-zero sum, um, but it, who has more basically? But zero sum is like I win, you lose. That is a finite mindset. 
okay? And infinite mindsets, the structure of infinite aware pragmatism is that perpetual change. The thing is, is that people who are finite in their minds are all generally conservative thinking to just change the way their, their psychology is wired. You cannot just ask to do them that. You have to develop for them a system or, or order which is perpetually disordered. So an order that changes itself without their intervention which allows them it, it basically it's like it's like giving giving um, a handicapped ability to like a person who cannot walk giving them uh, rollers uh, or or let's put it different a person who will see bacteria we give them a talus so but imagine you had innate ability to see bacteria and you don't need a talus uh, sorry telescope microscope Mm, ability, but conservatives don't have that innate ability to be creative. So you give them a, a tool which allows them to be creative. That tool we we develop for them to see the bacteria because they cannot. And so the infinite, uh, an infinite, especially infinite aware people, mm, uh, very pragmatic, very fluid, very fluid thinking. They're a general minority. They're very creative. They should develop this and allow. And, and it should be in a form of a system, legal system, political system, economic system, which allows people to be uh, constantly adaptive in their survival. Because in fact, this thing, the change requires, uh, sorry, for you to keep up with the change requires you a capacity to be more adaptive or able to move. And if you cannot move to another planet or another continent because everything is saturated with people, you, you have to adapt. Adaptation means flexibility, cognitive, creative flexibility. Uh, we could give every, we could maximize everybody's IQ if we could do that by gene editing uh, people so that everybody has higher and higher intelligence, which would have un, uh, un, uh, unprecedented uh, chaotic consequences. Out of it, the order would emerge eventually. Yes, but these things you cannot just jump into those. Uh, like tactics uh, and then consequences which will take time to deal with and can derail the whole problem. So it has to be uh, uh, um, fast enough progress to not destroy uh, the capacity to pursue the goal altogether, uh, but, but not fa too fast to destroy it basically and not too slow. So it has to be the flow progress in the flow. It's not too slow and too easy, it's boring, nobody does it, and it's not too hard and difficult that nobody understands what is going on, so they give up. It has to be at the edge zone of proximal development but on societal level and that will allow creative people to develop for creative people especially the conservative times allow them to develop uh, modes of creative thinking as a tool not as their innate capacity and that will maximize our ability to solve the issue of the of the ceiling of the ceiling of the of the self-actualization because what happened for example postmodern actualism it is a reactionary idea it, it, it is it has it it doesn't it doesn't talk about anything new, it doesn't talk about any it, everything they cover is obvious, talk about has already been talked about. Uh, the way it is just it's it's rejectionary. So they just reject everything and make it vague so you cannot you cannot really uh, simplify it. And it it's it, not simplified, but concretize that the claims which are being there is not uh, there are no proofs uh, that can be done. Uh, because in fact uh, that is a uh, you would consider that a low resolution or low uh, low quality uh, uh, intellectual development, which exists due to the fact that the ceiling was hit in the current iteration of the especially Western empires. It was hit, and there is no further. And, and instead of realizing that the struggle of further is had to be done, uh, what happens is that the ball bounces back off the ceiling, and a person or people bounce who reach the top, they bounce back off, and because society gets higher and higher on the on the Maslow pyramid as a whole. Um, especially the, the general, the majority, the, the normal, the average gets higher and higher in the pyramid. Those of the average, they 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 reach the higher levels even, and so they bounce back off the ceiling, and they bounce back off the ceiling, go, and then they go down, down, and then what it means is like you turn against ultra exactly the same thing. I'll try it like just like postmodernism. It's a reactionary movement. Uh, it, it it there is it as a thing in and of itself. It has nothing it is not a genuine new creative idea developed it is a reaction an answer to to a situation which is being observed which is poorly understood and it is made in in a in an unconscious unaware way and it and then people fall for it because it's like okay yes there is this struggle and people become supporters of these things you know uh, be it be it postmodernist be it um, outright uh, or new reactionary uh, movements which generally is Represented by alt-right in the recent example, um, and postmodernism 
Marxism is exactly that, uh, but uh, uh, from the from the let's say socialist types, well, you don't, the socialist types, but uh, people who who. It, the, the lack of concreteness uh, allow uh, it makes it difficult for me to to separate uh, the things which one depends on which and because they're more muffled uh, and that's a problem as well is that creative uh, creativity begins as very abstract and as it becomes more concrete it becomes scientific and so at first everything is qualitative and as time goes by we manage to quantify it so we become but quantifying i mean we make it more precise in analysis that's all so it's it, it becomes not only quantitative, but it also uh, adds to it a, a new dimension of quantitative analysis things are both qualitative and quantitative and the more they become as well as qualitative the more precise they are so natural sciences like physics it's extremely qualitative and quantitative but something like uh something like cubism or something like uh, contemporary dancing is extremely abstract or some weird music with weird footage and there's like, like different paintings on the walls and there's like some stones lying and there's like uh, a piece of wood which is and some figure carved on it and the whole installation means something but it's abstract the person tries to grasp and articulate that which really do it in words because there is no words to do it so they use a combination of words the mixes the mixes of things that already exist to articulate something that does not exist yet and we can eventually create words for it which we call neologisms right but that process uh, now imagine that process on an intellectual sphere uh, is that you, what you do you mix all things because this is what i'm tr no, doing right now which is when we're having conversations like these uh, on beverage special with the, this is this is what they do this is state the concept of state of the art something being state of the art state of the art means it's extremely abstract and you're you're in uncharted waters you don't know what you're doing uh, but you're 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 kind of feeling it but you cannot really grasp it and you're doing all these different things in hopes to capture and concretize that which you're trying to grasp that you're trying to articulate and the process of creativity the process of uh, developing something new is exactly that you have all the things which you use in permutations in uh, thousands and thousands of mixes trying to grasp that thing which you which which is not that but because we don't have words for it and we cannot really speak it out we cannot really draw it out we cannot really make sounds about it, you know we use the sounds uh, images and and movements that we that already existed and we try to mix them in a way kind of grasps that thing and then some other person comes on and says Hey, 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 and they add some extra this and this, and it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I think you're getting onto something. And this is the process of creativity. You create new by using the old in a way that wasn't used before. You discard eventually the old ways of explaining it because you create new forms, you create new words. And that's why you have expressivism as, a, as an art form appear. Before there was no expressivism, there was dude sensing. He, he was drawing something, but he was not really knowing. And another dude was like, yeah, yeah, I think I know what you're trying to refer here. It is this, and he shows him his painting. And it was like more and more dudes feel like they're feeling the same thing, but they cannot articulate articulate it and so they do it through the drawing rather than music and then eventually that becomes expressive this new thing and we call it activism or some other made-up name that we call it and it's this new thing that happens and it's part of integrated into the order that is part from moving chaos to order now postmodernism or or in for this case uh, neo reactionary movements such as alt-right they uh, they are not that they're not creative they're uh, well, you could, you can call them creative, but it's like lower level creation. What happens? They're bounds of the ceiling of this limit of creativity, uh, because they cannot go. For, a few people cannot go further. Diff different limitations, innate limitations or external limitations, <clears throat> and not being aware of what they do themselves. And I think it is mostly has to do with that they are not aware that they hit the ceiling, and so they bounce back in agony and lack of meaning. And so they start making up stories and start making up shit and, dis and distracting all things. And it's like, no, this is wrong. And I'm I'm gonna react to this reality in this way. And I'm gonna create a small order, which explains how that is wrong, because it, it will be meaningful and I will have a struggle and I'll be able to deal with it. And 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 in the beginning it is vague. But the thing is, is that the more concrete it becomes, the easier it is to uh, quantify. It's not only quantitative, but quantitative. The easier it is to compare in, because it's more precision, more precise, more concrete. And you see if that thing responds to something or not. And here, something like postmodernism or more precisely poststructuralism uh, wins even further beyond in terms of reactionarism is that it does not try to be concrete. And because it does not concrete, you can 
grasp it. And because you cannot grasp it, it all it is always abstract. But the progress of creation requires abstract things to become concrete. And if something, everything, uh, if something is always abstract, you cannot really use it because you cannot you cannot concretize it. You cannot integrate it into your order because order is more concrete. The the process of ordering is the process of making something more concrete, and you cannot do it with uh, a thing which does not want to be concrete. And that's why it is hard to grasp and our psyche rejects it on a but it makes, makes no sense because you cannot concrete who want to concretize uh, make it that way now it can be a, in a way, way or unaware ways so for example jordan peterson was claiming that uh, some of these ideologues they do it intentionally uh, and i i don't really think that uh, i think it is it is the, the push itself is very unintentional and that prevents people to um, to to realize what what is it they're doing they're very, very um uh, how do you say? It? They're very um, well. They're, they're unaware of of this. And this the issue here is that when they're unaware of the situation, keep perpetuating it. Uh, they, 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 they. You have order, and you have unknown terms. Artists abstract, right? And abstract things generally abstract. Even us here communicating, I'm trying to articulate things. I'm using abstract. And so what happens is that these uh, the people say, hey, hey, you know, when you try when you're an artist and you abstract and over time the process of our art art becomes science so every science was first an art just like uh, just like uh, astronomy was first astrology just like mm, uh, just like physics was first uh, and chemistry was first alchemy uh, also so does for example mm, any art becomes more precise as an art form uh, writing uh, suddenly becomes a a form of book we have books and then we use the method uh, have uh, scientific it is more uh, structured more quantitative uh, uh, form of a poetic art form but they all exist at the same time but one is right now the thing is uh, what what for example um, that is the, and i think between the creators of these reactionary movements when they're stuck is that at the ages of intellect at the ages of decadence uh, they uh, they um the, the more conservative mind uh, their their react reactionary ideas they still have they they have concreteness very much so and they make assumptions even if they're wrong they know those assumptions it drives them if they don't have assumptions they want to have order but the thing is is that with uh, liberal types uh, they don't concreteness because because they can be more abstract. The problem with that is that you you live in an ordered uh, in an ordered environment, and so if you're living, if you're trying to be more, more abstract, abstract, then you cannot you cannot grasp the complexity. You cannot grasp the volume of things to be done. You cannot contest something. You cannot make it. Because you cannot make it into an order. It is a perpetual. Stuff. So, in my understanding, uh, post structuralism, post modernism is so, so attractive because it prevents you having um from having uh, you do but it's it's partial it's small and it is it is structured it is it is uh, sorry it is non-structured is that you can never achieve order and that is means perpetual in the stages of decadence perpetual struggle is a great or very uh, appealing solution and so in my understanding Postmodernism offers something which a new reactionary like alt right does not offer. It it offers perpetual struggle, because uh, the, the 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 concrete order of alt right uh, the struggle is not perpetual. The, there will be goals that can be achieved, and it will be the end of it. All right, and it can be done through violent means. It means doesn't matter. But perpetual struggle means because you cannot concretize the the abstract because you can concretize the abstract. The attempt to keep concretizing the abstract is what you do. So you you're doing concretization for the sake of concretization but you never achieve it because you keep it weak and it is appealing because it prevents you from uh, it, it you you have constant struggle everything is a struggle because nothing can be concretized and so uh, nothing matters so sorry everything matters because nothing matters and i think it is a warped uh, attempt at realizing at the late stages of empire attempt uh, and america is an excellent example for this which is um, which is why i'm talking about it is an excellent attempt at trying to find for the nothing really matters situation which is hitting the ceiling with no 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 everything is wrong everything really matters and so nothing really matters is the ceiling 
right? And you have to break through it. And it's a struggle. And the answer to the struggle is like, no, no, everything really matters. Nothing really matters. And this is this is at the bottom of the argument of postmodernism or poststructuralism, which it rejects the um, positivism. It rejects the structuralism. Because those things, um, those things, uh, it ab makes them abstract, makes them vague. Because it allows to claim that everything matters. Because everything is a struggle. Uh, everything is a struggle. Nothing is, nothing is certain. Nothing is concrete. Uh, hence, why you have moral relativism. Uh, hence, why you have cultural relativism. You know, everything is a struggle. You cannot compare things really, but you can actually, and you cannot. And that's the vagueness. This is the abstractness of this because there is no concreteness. And this is a warped answer to to the to the um, well. So far, it is so. To my understanding, so far, it's, it's the only way uh, people, in unaware fashion, they they have this limitation of the of the world. Uh, Cloud Atlas is a good one because it's about to be, roughly speaking, uh, and um, the the abstractness of the um, the abstract this abstractness they it prevents them from uh, um, moving forward. Um, but it's exactly what they want because there is nowhere to move because the ceiling is there and this vagueness does not advertise and not allow you to move forward and which is why it's so appealing which is why it uh, makes sense but on unaware intuitional like subconscious unconscious level which, which is what is happening the process and I, I, I thought I've, I've thought and I've noticed that if you make people kind of aware of this underlying process like oh so that's why so trying to understand why certain things or why certain things or, talk, or why you accept certain ideas as as valid and it, it, it's like oh like what then and then the real they they aware of the real struggle the real struggle is the lack of meaning and that is the eternal struggle the, the, the struggle of the struggles and the thing is when we act it out to the end um, age of decadence and uh, go haywire in a society it's the, the the only struggle that is left is the lack of struggle and it is the hardest struggle to get to but people generally are unaware of it people are in a huge manner they're too they're too consumed by the state the previous stages they're too distracted there it's it, it's it's too much uh, thinking about uh, about uh, past things without thinking uh, in a bigger picture because ability is very limited and that's why we have thinkers and I think this is the next level uh, this is the next limit of the uh, of the human uh, I will, uh, progress where we find a way of how to expand out of this limitation because in fact for example moving Elon Musk he's like uh, he, moving to Mars right what happens if you're moved to Mars? You have more struggle. Struggle for survival on Mars because it's a hostile place. You don't have the things you have on the planet. And a lot of people support it because on, on one level or another, we not only explore, we not only maximize survival uh, because, because we're multi-planetary species. So if one planet is gone, there are still people on the other planet. But, but also what happens is that uh, there is struggle on the planet too, which is why it's appealing twice appealing Feeling, you know, we not only solve the problem of one plan, but we also uh, solve the problem of lack of meaning and lack of struggle. And so they support. So it's, it's not it's not like uh, well, trying to explain something to people is very complicated. So you what it's general ignorance because uh, you you just recommend them books and it's like okay 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 now you get things now you see how things work and then. You get them different perspective books, and so when perspective starts clashing, uh, and the person has to, to actually observe that, like okay, this makes sense, but this doesn't make sense, and then this kind of makes sense, and it counteracts, it, and they see uh, incongruence, and they try to look for explanations, and they develop. I, I call it a higher order existence, a higher order being where a person makes a more deeper sense of the world and mechanism upon which it operates. So intellectual, human, um, you name it, and. Um, what happens is that that higher order to bring person closer to being more aware, more more is important, more correct education, uh, more uh, uh, it, 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 regardless of political uh, sides. That's what education should be. They should teach you all sides on school, not not so that you accept them all. Is that you see that all of them are kind kind of valid and kind of valid, and you see where they don't fit and you find the issues. Like all right, what now? And the right questions begin, and that does not really destroy order. I think the societies which do that 
kind of education, it only makes them stronger um, because they will be aware that of a greater struggle. And so, and so the this, the barometer of the of the muscle pyramid, the higher level, goes because like, okay, 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 we we have to secure we have to secure the the last levels. We have to secure the issue of the ceiling because ceiling will fuck us up and we will never be able to go up to the higher levels. And understanding it as a society is is important, and that's what people will do, and they will jump at it. And they will want to deal with it, but not aware of this if they're not taught about the multiplicities and different things which are true and not true, and what is true, what is not true. Uh, they uh, they don't know how to distinguish black from white. Uh, everything is muffed, is vague, and and it's like a little bit of everything, but there is no concrete because you can't really compare things because there is no capacity to rank, and it is not done. It it is not done to ignore. This technically ignoring reality to a degree. Uh, although reality is neurochemicals and electric brain, but uh, we are surprisingly we somehow share all of it together. And what happens is that the other thing is that ha happens is that uh, as you society reach, like, because Chinese don't have this problem with postmodernism, they don't they have plenty of struggles. Like well, what the hell is this shit? We have more things to deal with. This is they call there is a term in in China online term for people who are obsessed with this. It's called uh, bite war, and by War means uh, Western white liberal who is generally upper middle class uh, or upper class, and they don't have worries in their life, so they spend time uh, talking and thinking about these uh, great ideas, you know, or or half great ideas. They make up struggle because there is not enough struggle in their life, and it, the term is bites war, and and it epitomizes the difference between, for example, China and America is that they realize like what the hell are you talking about? We have problems because they're in. Uh, the lower stages of survival, the lower ranks of survival are still not fulfilled for them. So, and as discrepancy allows them to observe it, and like, well, this is not true. Um, and it's like, well, you you obsessing with these things because you have nothing else to do, you don't have meaning in your life. And and that's exactly right. And the term captures, this term captures the struggle, is that nothing is a, is a ceiling. And when nothing really matters, the answer is, well, everything really matters. Which is counter argument, why modernism and uh, reactionary as well. Uh, is that say, no, everything really matters, and because nothing really matters. And that's, in fact, it's a circle, but it's a cope strategy for the fact that uh, you're un because there are g people are on their majority who reach those higher levels, they're still unaware. I call them infinite unaware people. They're still unaware of, of the. the to not a not surprise, but of the uh, meta struggle, which is the search for meaning itself. A search for in search for survival is exactly that because meaning is it all is what so when surviving you have nothing else to do, and so, so you you you're searching for survival, and that is what they do. And that is why they create these ideas and ideal and and they support. They can be unaware. There is a necessity in them to survive, but there is nothing that makes them to do it. it not, nothing that burns in them the desire to do that. And for that reason, I think that's why Peterson mentions for oh, how to deal with people so-called, let's say, infected with postmodernism or poststructuralism is is give them uh, responsibility because responsibility in 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 um, considers struggle. It considers well, meaning, uh, and and well, freedom of speech is another one. It's it's in itself a struggle, and uh, that is that is why it's so fervent. That's why it's so emotional. These discussions, these uh, protesters, um, because um, everything matters to them, because nothing matters, and nothing matters is a horrible reality of meaninglessness. So everything matters makes suddenly a very meaningful existence where everything is a struggle that is why um, that is why intersectionality that's why feminism that is why scientific uh, truths are false uh, you reject things because rejecting them makes creation of alternatives uh, meaningful because it's a struggle to create them because well if we don't have it we have to make you know the genders are not true we have to make them up and you make 40 years because it is a struggle to define something after you rejected something else, and it, it is just a it's just a coping strategy uh, elevated to a, to an ideology or to an intellectual uh, you call it coupe de gras um, or de gras or whatever mm, where where you where you're uh, how do you say it? you're making yourself feel better because you don't feel well. It's 
it, it's a, I, I just see it as a self-defense mechanism. And uh, same, same for any reactionary movement. Because they're not genuine. They're not genuine, creative new things. They're not uh, articulating something abstract. Although I think to a degree they do. Because for me, I observe this, and I am trying to articulate to you which is what they do uh, using the, the things which already exist, such as uh, these concepts. And I was like, okay, this, this is the struggle, and they have hit the ce- That is what happened. We hit the ceiling, and we have to find a way to solve the ceiling. And finding a way to solve the ceiling is the meta struggle, is the struggle of all struggles. You know, is the king struggle? Is the emperor of the kings? Is the, the god of gods? Uh, uh, song of songs? Um, you know, story of stories? Uh, movies? You name is the meta thing? Is that which they all held? Is the is the struggle? And uh, that is, I think, that is the ultimate thing. And that we are unaware they hit the ceiling, and so we develop all these warped ways, of, uh, which I call the bouncing back warped ways of how we develop things. Um, uh, and trying to find a solution to it without being aware what we're actually seeing. because in fact those things in the, in the lives of people who who generally are much better off than the rest of and so they create meaning by creating struggle where the struggle does not exist but to, to exist they just destroy that, that which prevents that struggle from existing um, and it goes on and on and I can kind of pause here because I probably have gone on one hour without stopping and this is my personal record, I assume. <laughs> but um, yes, um, what do you think? Considerations, ideas. Just one of the last bits to come in here is uh, this artist. Um, he's quite fascinating, uh, Oliver uh, D. Sargazan. Uh, he's got a. There's one where he starts off in like a suit. And I can't particularly see where I can find it, but it kind of represents to me uh, the struggle. He's kind of turned that into a art form. Um, I think it's more like a, maybe it's like a DVD that you actually buy or like an online DVD that you download uh, where he does like the full hour long performance or so. And I think that's what I watched. I really uh, enjoy his, uh, I think it's called Transfiguration. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, from what I see, what the things are showing, it looks like he's trying to articulate exactly that. Uh, the, 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 well, the struggle, the, comp- the meaninglessness, the complexity of the meaninglessness. And there's not many answers. Oh, and that's why I think the conservatives uh, have lack of, lack of struggle. They create uh, struggle by creating a give new order. To all, all things, and liberals like, they, but they don't give you or destroy the old things, and that gives perpetual, which is why it is more attractive. It gives perpetual struggle, because or, or liberal uh, conservatives will give more um, uh, defined, defined, finite struggle, uh, answer to the finite struggle, or new, new finite struggle. But um, abstractness of, of liberals gives them struggle, and um, what he's doing right now is he articulates something. He doesn't know uh, uh, his sense of it, you know, and using a suit. But at the time, he, I think it's a clay. He's putting clay. exactly, and uh, 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 you see, so he's trying to. Uh, and now, now what we're doing, in, in fact, our conversation itself is state of the art conversation because we are trying to articulate something which we don't really understand, and we're using all terminology. And so, uh, I think it looks like a zombie. He shows like a. Zombie zombie, like bleeding from the nose, you know, and a bit of agus aggressive. Um, and he's not mental, he's not crazy, that's what you could see, but he's, he, he's, he feels out, but he does not really understand, he cannot verbalize it, uh, he's showing us, he's this faceless, he's this uh, with, with bleeding black eyes, like it, there is darkness, there is nothing nothingness because nothingness is generally darkness is that darkness is nothing there and so there is this faceless uh, darkness under this faceless thing there is a darkness and so the meaning can be that something which lost its sense because in first it was a face you know something which lost its has become this warped thing which has uh, which has costume which has a name, name order um, so i think it represents the, and and then and then the the face of the other is dead and 
is bleeding and is and is uh, from within it's it's oozing this black goo uh, thingness so it, like it's exhausted itself and uh i maybe i'm just looking for bias or or he's doing exactly that by saying that we hit the ceiling and he's realizing that we hit the ceiling but he cannot really articulate it so i bet if we invite him we let him listen to our conversation he'll find um, a lot of meaning in it because it w i think it will to answer to his uh, issue because that's exactly it he shows this warped thing of, of sand why I sand because sand is sand is abstract and if sand is wet it can become concrete and using sand uh, or, or or clay which allows you to shape it the way you want uh it, it he's an unprecise thing and he cannot do it. and that's i think what he says and it, but he shows like blood in it you know and there is a rage in it but he doesn't know what it is in you know, order that is enraged and uh, in like a arts class when your teacher so what did this painter want to say uh, with, with this painting you know something like this feel like that again and but uh, that is exactly what he's trying to articulate and then the order is gone and there is just this gooey mass of nothingness which is oozing darkness of meaninglessness you know and it just has a mouth and it's like uh, it's gross and it's trying to, and it's trying to make itself look pretty warped uh, it's very abstract right now this is very he was concrete he was a dude with a suit you know this abstract thing that is that is the transition that he notices between the fact that after this ex, after extreme order extreme order leads us to the end and at the end there is extreme chaos of nothingness nothing matters because everything is meaningless is abstract and pointless you you have to concretize it and concretizing is 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 you know and i think i think that is what we're kind of trying to do with that uh, in, in yeah. his artistic way in, but he's using visual medium for that yeah i wonder does kind of make sense playing well i uh, yeah yeah yeah. yeah yeah so because because when you talk about ceiling, my first thoughts, right, were, uh, you know, the glass ceiling or like a, even when you first mentioned it, it was kind of like this idea uh, that I think a lot of teenagers have, where it's like there's a consolidation of energy into this unifying uh, uh, and validating force of one's existence and effort, like a homogenizing like unity of love, like, you know, a coming together of partners, a sex with society. Uh, and that's kind of like this, this ceiling that I think a lot of spiritual quest uh, kind of operates on. But you also at the same time, you have a ceiling of uh, the internal struggle as well. There's a, a TED talk, I think, called like uh, uh, Jihad or My Jihad um, or Jihad 2.0 or something like that. Uh, and the I won't be able to ever find it. Um, but uh, if someone ever does, they can leave it in a comment because I saw it ages ago. And they kind of talk about how Jihad had kind of been misinterpreted as a external thing when really it's about this internal struggle. Uh, so we see actually with a few older movies if we could just go in order of these uh old 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 movies so okay we got cognitive dissonance here uh we got coping everything's already small so all right we have uh the the cabinet of uh so the movie industry germany was a big player uh and this is between the two world wars 19 around 1920 they were pumping out a lot and you had the movie the cabinet of dr caligari and this one was kind of about why a man's own uh, insufficiency in being able to get the woman he wants and his subconscious manifests itself as a demon in the society and the society now has to deal with the repercussions of this uh shadow that was not correctly dealt with and at the same time, you had uh, Nosferatu, which is kind of based off the Dracula story. And there's an interesting part in it where the Dracula figure kind of uh, uh, symbolizes also the plague. Uh, so 
wherever he goes there's also rats uh pillaging and people are kind of concerned about the disease the rats will spread whereas Dracula is more like a human embodiment of disease or a plague uh and a vampire kind of of the social level and that's really interesting where it's like if we kind of ignore the shadows uh of a society or, or of an individual or many individuals of a people uh, it will then express itself in a society. At the same time, uh, you had the movie uh, Battleship Potemkin, which, you know, if a lot of people you re you hear about Marxists, and if you're kind of right-leaning or libertarian-leaning, uh, you'll read some economics and then realize, well, that's stupid. Um, how did they ever expect that to work? But at the same time, it's a political uh, movement rather than necessarily an economic movement to an extent like it's it's a mixture of both it uses like the claims of economy to well it uses politics to try and address economic uh, uh observations uh rather than necessarily economic problems it projects a morality onto it but we can actually see uh in this movie it's a soviet film uh the blossoming of circumstances where a marxist revolution actually does make sense where there is a corrupt uh, government and the military, the navy here are being uh, abused and mistreated. In which case, revolution uh, is actually kind of called for. There's another movie called The State of Siege. It's a Southern American uh, movie, more recent. And in that movie as well, they it's a uh, uh, someone kind of debating a arrested uh, Marxist uh, who was a terrorist. Uh, kind of on his motives and you kind of uncover some cases where marxism kind of does make sense and i wrote about this uh in a blog post uh called where socialism fits actually before i seen these movies kind of where you know there is a call for revolution when certain societal things start falling down and he so one of the things to important to note about the book versus uh uh john glubb's uh book versus your commentary is uh he focused specifically on patterns within nations rather than within uh continuations of individuals so decadence he was speaking on behalf of a nation uh rather than of individuals or everything was kind of on the perspective of a a ma macro scale uh, whereas what you brought in with the commentary is a way to kind of combine that with more things like what we've covered with Peterson's lectures or modern sensibilities with Jonathan Haidt and these other works where it is it's, also yeah, it's simultaneously exactly. a manifestation in the individual. Mm -hmm. Because he's macro, he's very macro, but uh, I'm, I'm just taking here Jung's position because um, he he was uh, saying that uh, we indeed uh, should not focus on the like social psychology as a main culprit, but uh, on uh, personality psychology, or individual psychology, and general psychoanalysis, because uh, societies are made of individuals, and uh, it's yeah, like you are the lowest unit. If we split you in half, you die. So we cannot split it further. So the, right. the lowest unit for humans so far is the human. Uh, and and um, that is why he was saying that if we analyze individuals, we can analyze them also in mass because by understanding the individual mass is just a sum of individual uh, uh, leanings but there uh, there is more of them and 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 that gives additional uh, warped uh, variations of so mm. so for example two crazy people will not just be two crazy people they can create a product of two, being two crazy people and it'll be mad mad uh, mad ideology now that is a social psychology phenomenon but it is rooted and originated in people being crazy and two of them being crazy and they just mm. create a mad ideology. No, define crazy, define mad ideology, but I'm just giving an example of what I mean here. Is that right. some some of individuals, uh, it's not just, it's not it's not a sum, it's more of a product. So uh, so Jung was, for example, treating these uh, individuals, uh, or you treat everybody as, indi as individual and consider individual uh, similarities and differences and that on a greater scale, it generates all these different products of interactions between these different individuals within groups and groups of these individuals with other groups of individuals. Uh, and there is like thousands of thousands of groups. And it's a, it's you need you need a supercomputer to account for all the groups, and then you can start. I think it is to a degree possible. And 
machine learning and predictive statistics were doing that is that there was a story of, uh, I don't know, Best Buy or Walmart sending to a teen in the US back in the early 2000s, sending her, uh, sending her um, um, diapers for a baby and, and a coupons for diapers for a baby. And yeah. uh, it found, and the thing is, the, the algorithm knew that the teenager was pregnant before the teenagers and the family and the teenager knew that, they, that she was. And it did so because it, it learned by the behavior of people who are, are to be pregnant and who will how they behave, their preferences, and accumulating this data and then the law of large number king, which is where we quantify the quality of criteria. And it becomes even more precise, it becomes more concrete. And it becomes... Right. A higher order, 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 order. Yes, or second order with big higher order, order, and and then you can pre and then you can not only uh, explain something by with that model, and they predicted. And a father was like, this this was in some book. I don't remember the name of the book, which we mentioned, but it was a true story. And what happened is that uh, the father was angry because he saw like, well, my daughter is not angry. My daughter is not pregnant. She's only seventeen or sixteen or something, but actually she was was pregnant and she didn't know and they didn't know and then father like comes back to the company actually you, that is like um, uh, it's true that uh, that she was pregnant uh, like um, I, I apologize and whatnot and it was the whole story and it was just give validity to to uh, give a concrete proof to the capacity predictive capacity of something which not only qualitative but also quantitative and mm. well it's it's a, it's a mad thing but um, on individual level and it's individuals and in mass they are also individual, but also en masse. But their behavior still are on individual level first. You act it out. Right. You breathe, you move, you leave the house, you enter the house, you do different actions. They are your individual actions. Now, they're, they can be aided by something, but you still do them. You can choose not to do them, but sometimes you do. And when you do, and many other people like you do, there is a matter. Why do you do that? Why don't you do that? When do you do it? When you don't do it? With whom you do it? With whom you don't do it? You know, what things you use while doing it, and what things you don't use while doing this. And then you can find out what people think by how they act, truly what they think. They can be unaware of, because you can, people can act uh, in a uh, subconscious way. It's like habits, bad habits, for example. People are not like, um, I don't know, uh, scratching your forehead all the time, you know, and it becomes a rash. But a people, person is just unaware until it becomes a physical pain. You know, but if if there was if the if there was enough data collected, it would it could be predicted that you have that, and the system says, hey, you 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 have this unaware behavior of scratching. You know, it's like no, I don't, while scratching your forehead, and then you realize, oh, actually, I do. You know, but you know that it it, it doesn't. It's not magic. It's not some super super made uh, like conceptual. It's not. It's it's not none of that kind. It is just well, a lot of thinking, a hell of a lot of thinking. And this productive capacity, uh, it, well, it is, it is great, but it's a little dangerous because it allows you to manipulate and control. You know ahead of the person, and the person, you not only know ahead of what the person might do or will go through, but you can also, uh, you can also be aware of that, and they not. So not only they don't know that they're going through it, you know that they are going through it, and or you know that they will not know that they will go through it, or they will not be aware while going through it. But you do, and you know that they will go through it, and and and, and you can predict it with high certainty. And that is like this is so much. This is information asymmetry to to a, to a very high degree, especially the person who has access to collection of such information. And that was and the example of a teenage pregnant, uh, and she was pregnant, and she gave birth to a child uh, when she was seventeen um, because she was uh, having unprotected sex with her boyfriend, and parents didn't know. Uh, and but 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 Walmart knew because uh, statistics, because some geek uh, or or dozen of geeks with the with the computers uh, were developed models which allowed them to 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 predict uh, consumer behavior, so they can maximize the profits for a company, and they and they found out as well that. So you can actually predict somebody going pregnant being not themselves, you know, mm, stuff like that. It's, I mean, it's amazing, amazing. Probably also a solution to right. the unawareness problem. Right. So I can't believe people use YouTube without ad blockers because I was trying to play the video about the empires and I was getting like an ad every five seconds. So then I enable my ad blocker and now YouTube's not working. Uh, so I should never have disabled it. <laughs> not, not <laughs> but, uh, 
Better than adblock is uBlock Origin. It it works better. Yeah, well, I, I like. Uh, I think everyone's got their own preference. The one I like is AdGuard because it blocks ads and everything. But there's no affiliate link, so I don't get any benefit from recommending it. But uh, AdGuard, like, it runs. Uh, it's very nifty, their company. But anyway, so regardless of the data mining uh, issue, I uh, to go to the uh, to go to the ceiling uh, topic. I think uh, one of the things, because what I want to play in that little history of the countries one, which isn't loading anymore, uh, is a clip um, where you then have the birth of Muhammad, and then suddenly the caliphate just goes boom, and then takes over everything. Uh, and that's like an instance where like the individual really matters. Uh, and you see that a lot where there is this struggle, um, uh, this age of what's the last age called uh the third uh age of decline and then suddenly uh an individual be it hitler or stalin or muhammad or jesus whatever can now reinvigorate uh the culture of the people but you also have an interesting propaganda piece like cloud atlas which uh is where they try and make it so any individual uh, you know, be it whoever you are in society, your life matters. Uh, and they kind of scale that out uh, over uh, six generations or so in the movie. And I think it's uh, it's really interesting uh, because it's one of those ones that uh, really it communicates that kind of esoteric uh, aspect uh, that people kind of fall into a higher power into. It kind of communicates it in a story. Uh, and, but I think it's also to an extent like that kind of coping mechanism where if we are heading into nihilism, we're trying to find uh, ways to make our life meaningful and Cloud Atlas kind of tries and articulates that uh, in a way, you know, as one of the many alternatives, like Soma is another alternative, which is like a metaphor from Brave New World on any drug. Uh, that kind of makes you happy. Another movie, when we get into then coping mechanisms, uh, is Vanilla Sky. Vanilla Sky is the uh, the whole kind of premise of that is someone not willing to come to terms uh, with a thing his subconscious is struggling with. Um, and the movie is kind of the nightmare that then pursues in his subconscious, very much like, uh oliver the french artist uh, video who i played before kind of actually articulated now in a movie and fortunately uh that movie kind of provides you know a, an exploration of that and also the impacts for this person and you also have very similar movies like this the one with jim carrey and kate winslet the uh uh one about forgetting memories um and a lot of uh kind of explorations of that uh a uh, cipher in the Matrix, the first Matrix movie, is another example of that character where one's inability to resolve their own cognitive dissonance now plays a uh, the shadow kind of now consumes them, and I think that is what Oliver was expressing in his transfiguration, which is you know we're meant to be ordered and a representative representative of order and success in a suit. Uh, but then the shadow, if we haven't dealt with it, consumes. And if we go to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right, we have the basic needs of physiological needs at the basic, right? If you don't get them, you're dead. Uh, then you have safety needs, which are more like psychological needs, like the necessary ones to not become a neurotic or not to enter into psychosis. And then all the others are kind of more optional. So like the psychological needs are kind of like for us to not want to kill ourselves. Uh, and then the self-fulfillment ones are where we kind of feel satiated and they kind of last for very brief moments, uh, I guess. But I think one of the tricks here with what happens with the age of uh, intellect is a foregoing, like in terms of this, uh, it's not necessarily, to some extent it is of course that the physiological needs are easily taken care of like the rising tides of the economy the booming economy through trade uh the development of cities uh the development of of agriculture now you know those needs can be taken care of uh without that much work and 
the author, uh, he also goes, John, he also goes into uh, how even in these times of decline, people actually start working less and less and less. And they actually start engaging more and more with leisure rather than actually things that will stimulate the economy properly. Uh, so they start going more into uh, false games rather than real games. And I think what it is, isn't necessarily that uh, those needs, it's like, I hope no one hears that background noise. There's construction work uh, happening, unfortunately. But the uh, yeah, so you know, I th don't think it's necessarily about those needs necessarily actually being met. I think it's more at taking them for granted, um, or or feeling as if they're not necessarily that important. Uh, uh, that's kind of my little take there, where it's like. Yes, that is correct. Especially, like, say, for instance, with liberals, uh, you know, or high creativity, which is you can be more flexible. You can kind of, like, at least for me, I can, uh, if I do need money, there was like a learning I had a while ago, which is if I need money, I can acquire money. So, therefore, I don't need to focus on the stability of money. I can kind of get it yes. uh, when I need it. But to some extent, that's also like a coping mechanism, like a false axiom. Uh, because I'm hoping that that statement about reality will stay true throughout uh, life. And when it doesn't, yes. then, oh, God, uh, back down there. And you also see things where, like, say, for instance, divorce or job loss, they can hit into the safety needs, like the basic needs, as well as the psychological yes, yes. needs, self-fulfillment, especially, like, even uh, divorce because... That's why people are so emotional and very defensive during, during divorce uh, rulings, right. for example. Yeah. And because also why, right, at lower levels. Yeah, and but why, if one, just one small remark to what yeah. you said. The re reason why we get used to it, why take it for granted, uh, it, again, is the survival psychological uh, extension of the survival mechanism. And what it does, like we consider the thing you said will continue perpetually. But assuming that it continue perpetually is important because if you don't it is an extra thing for you to worry about and that is nerve-wracking that can make you unsettled and be emotionally challenging and you don't want to feel comfortable next day so you assume things are gonna be all right you know so when somebody is overly optimistic they're like overly uh, they ignore all of the issues very much and so they it will go wrong until they cannot be ignored anymore for these people and overly pessimistic what they do is like, everything is wrong Every, and that's i call overly pessimist is denialist and overly optimist is a um, not a re idealist exactly overly, pe overly opt optimistic person is an idealistic and overly pessim pessimistic person would be a nihilistic that's how I would put it. And somebody rational or somebody who's well balanced, you have to find balance between pessimism and optimism within yourself. And societies at large have to do that the same. And, uh, well, realists uh, or pragmatists, they're uh, generally hard to come by. People are just one way or the other. And, well, based on that, then just fight for survival with others in the environment it's like it's like think of a thousand it's a sandbox it's like video game sandbox you know or or like 10 balls 10 balls represent 8 billion people you throw them in a small in a small bottle and you shake them and they hit the sides of the bottle and they hit each other that is what it means to live on this planet because you, you interact with all of these th different environmental criteria but now imagine 8 billion of these balls are doing that in a huge bottle which is a planet you know this is exactly yeah. the the same thing and then and then that limits us uh, well we have to have like, cut downs because it's like uh, overly pessimistic or overly optimistic or overly pessimistic is, is a, is a cop-out uh, in my understanding yeah. um, so no. so i kind of think here right is that uh one you have like coping away like coping mechanisms like the wikipedia page uh on coping completely changed my life a while ago uh, like 10 years ago, I uh, kind of read through it and it really helped me a lot. Um, understanding like coping mechanisms as well as uh, our cognitive dissonance completely changed my life. Uh, but, and also the hierarchy of needs, like, you know, it, it was like, oh, okay, you have your uh, cognitive dissonance, which is your ideal self, uh, who you should be, and then your uh, uh, actual self who you actually are and then you're once like oneself who do you actually want to be uh and so the ideal self is kind of also where you place shame 
And the one self is like where you place your hopes and the actual self is where you place your expectations. And if there's a distance between any of them, then you end up in the state of uh, discontent or uh, despair. And depending on your awareness, uh, uh, you know, you, you will try and, uh, if you're completely not aware, it'll just be a shadow that consumes you. But the awareness, and you mentioned this also uh, in your monologue, which was you mentioned awareness, but there's another step uh, on top of awareness that's necessary, which is the acceptance stage. Because so often I'll observe things, even in my own life or in other people's lives or just in society in general, patterns of behavior. And I will understand it. I will be aware, like I'll be aware of it. I'll understand the inputs and the outputs and the pattern and why people do it. But I just refuse to accept it. I just, it, it's just infuriating. It just ticks me off. Yes, just, yes. I don't want to accept it. Right. Yes, yes. And I think, because it fights your, I, it fights your uh, ego fights. It's it's just you have to fight your survival mechanism. You have to understand your survival mechanism because it tells you if you did, the order of things might be wrong. And that's uncomfortable. Right. You want to feel that? You want to feel that? Feel uncomfortable because that is where you progress and people don't want to go on this and that's it's, it's it's just int we don't even think about it, it just happens but if you want to yeah. integrate if you want to accept, accept something, you have to accept that you will all be comfortable in the first stages of that and it will be a bit difficult but well it is yeah well i think one of the pieces of magic here right is uh, and with kind of tying this all into an innovative frontier of thought is uh, what politics does is it inverses uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow's hierarchy of needs is applicable for an individual self-action, but whenever you introduce politics, it flips it. And what it does is it then says, like, like and I don't mean like it puts physiological needs on the top. What I mean is it inverses the pyramid, so it's shaped like that instead, where the meta level is the largest part, and then the physiological needs is the tiny little consequence of ideology. Uh, and because what politics does is it turns uh, uh, in the ineffective uh, individual or family or tribal uh, will and ability into a collective force that then can eliminate nations uh, and conquer other nations, right? It turns it into a force to be reckoned with. Uh, an assimilation of power. And uh, that's something that uh, is very uh, difficult uh, to wrestle with, but it's also something that you see uh, Frederick Baser wrote about in the libertarian authors as well as John Stuart Mill uh, talked about this, uh, which is kind of like the the concerns, because Marxists, that's kind of like the Marxist theory, which is, well, let's just make it so ideology can solve these problems. Uh, whereas the libertarians were like, wait, 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 uh, danger, 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 uh, uh, you know, Swiss Family Robinson, if you do that, because uh, uh, what happens if it's not aligned with reality? Uh, and also, you know, that was one of the foundations of Beyond Good and Evil with Nietzsche. Like, what happens if your ideology isn't uh, allocated to reality at all? Because what happens is you now have a government uh, in an empire that under a democracy, the majority I can now do. So then you have a, a tribal warfare on who's pointing the gun to achieve what ends. Uh, so a lot of the times, I think why they can take the basic needs for granted uh, is because they're like, well, if I just vote in who I want, I can achieve my basic needs uh, through ideology, through politics. Um, you know, if you're poor uh, and then a politician is promising welfare, you can vote them in and then your your needs are taken care of. So there, if the politician doesn't get <laughs> in, then your needs are actually being threatened. And that causes you to, to yes. become uh, uh, More ideologically or even physically violent. Yes. Uh, I just no, no, I just want to add this one. The other, the other, on that, the other reason or maybe underlying why that happens is that you have more time. You you have more time to to do the other thing more. So so if your needs are basic needs are secured, you you need less time to spend on them, and so that also kind of shrinks temporarily shrinks the time necessary to ensure physiological and safety needs. Okay, you have a job. There is police to protect you. Uh, yada yada yada. And, and then yeah. 
it's it's more narrow and so of course and so that is taking it for granted and and then a bit of lack of meaning lack of meaning happens and then people's like hey, hey another way if you support this 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 will have a little bit extra on top of we 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 drop a penny on top of your pile if you if you if you support this huge thing and the penny on top right. of the pile is the is the is the, is the small part of the pyramid at the bottom right and uh, yeah i think it's because there's temporarily no no stress no pressure to pursue more important things like you're not hungry you don't have to rush somewhere or at least mo a lot of people are not and so they don't have to do it so they can spend time on the more uh, less chips things including intellectual thinking and you can just sit right. in sofa and you have armchair philosophy and yada yada like what we're doing now we're not we're not yeah. working in the field because there's food um we don't need that and that's another condition which makes it inverted in a sense right i actually talked about that like the free time i call it uh you know the birth of disposable time uh because the in the tech industry there's a lot of diversity working groups which is essentially just uh 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 my what is it unrecruiting recruiting uh underutilized demographic clusters uh into your industry and then i kind of talk about well is it really diversity we should kind of be concerned because uh if we're just assimilating what was diverse then we're actually you know doing an anti-pattern for diversity and the real issue with uh, uh, racial diversity in open source actually seems to be circumstances that are reducing uh, disposable time, uh, which can then go towards useless pursuits of open source or an ideological uh, issue of principles where one should devote the time, be it commercial, like the ideological, the mimetic uh, realm uh, when we have that pyramid the Maslow hierarchy of needs like that uh, when we're operating on principles. And, but in that, then as an evangelist, you also have an ethical obligation to ensure that the principles you are trying to evangelize or instill uh, are actually going to uh, meet uh, the individual or the people's uh, own needs and empowerment rather than just assimilate them into your own worldview. I kind of articulate that in that post. Uh, so one of the things we also see, uh, let's just make sure I've got all my tabs great. Yeah. Uh, uh, D. Nibu Lungen, I guess you'll probably be able to pronounce that more correctly. Did I say it right? It's, it's German. You're German, right? Um, uh, right well, I'm, I'm not German, but yeah. D. Nibu Lungen is the uh, story, yes. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. You, you want me to right. elaborate on it? Yeah. Mm. No, 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 no. So I'll, I'll elaborate. I was just making sure I pronounced it right. But yeah, so with this movie, uh, it's kind of interesting because you have a situation where it's like a very old folklore that they kind of turned into a movie. Uh, yeah, so it's from uh, 1200 AD. And what happens is uh, there's kind of like this, you know, pr uh, premium fellow and he now, you know, goes about a little journey, kills a dragon and go, gets immortal. And then uh, he takes a liking to someone and the jealousy love triangle happens. He ends up getting killed. And then the wife is his, uh, ends up like just pretty much what happens is the kings would prefer to eliminate empires of their people for their own petty little games. Uh, and I think that's kind of uh, interesting. Uh, that uh, is exactly just a small, just a small yeah. thing on that. That is exactly what I was talking about when the elites are are hurting people because hurting people will create struggle for the elites to deal. With. You're basically creative, so you have meaningful existence those troubles. And because there's nothing else to 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 struggle about, mm -hmm. you start making up stuff and you make up stuff of with whom it is kind of manageable to do it. It's not too difficult. It's not too easy. You know, if it it was too difficult, the people. Would, would get you and uh, it would be no success if it was if it was too easy you wouldn't be doing that in the first place uh, and uh, we can like uh, we can attribute this to stupidity which i don't attribute to malice that which can be attributed to stupidity or we can attribute it to awareness or lack of awareness which can be also the case not they're not stupid they can be unaware of their of their actions and nibelungi is exactly that is that uh um, burn down uh, the the whole empire because it will give you a lot of struggle and a lot of things to deal with and you will have more meaning 
and don't burn too much because you will suffer from it so it's like damage just to be mm. but self damage uh, uh, to a degree where you don't uh, where you're not capable to benefit from the fruits of your progress but also have enough struggle to feel satisfied in existence uh, and uh, and that's movie well kind of <laughs> Uh, articulate so and, and which is what i mentioned the building because those people the kings and the emperors they are at the ceiling yeah and so then we also have the movie metropolis which is kind of somewhat similar to battleship uh potent kim potent well, how do we say it potemkin yeah battleship potemkin ah, okay if it they call it uh, right yeah. so yeah in metropolis yeah. uh it's kind of like a frankenstein type story but also somewhat like a uh brave new world 1984 kind of like a predecessor it's also kind of equated to the uh, matrix a little bit but essentially uh you have this uh utopian world where there is the uh yeah kind of like brave new world where there's this kind of utopia uh, where the working the bourgeoisie live and then there's a working class underground who powers it all and then eventually there's a lady who is uh, the the man ends up seeing the working class and then one of the bourgeoisie men uh, the kind of the prince of the bourgeoisie ends up seeing the working class and then extends tremendous empathy uh, and then the uh, and also the woman kind of talks a lot about how the intellect is from the bourgeoisie has to be combined with the w hands of the working class uh, and mediated through the heart. And that's kind of how you solve it. Uh, you know, a little bit of a, uh, a trope, but kind of an interesting exploration to another pre-World War II uh, type movie. And apparently the Nazi party also loves this movie uh, because it, it's a cautionary tale, the way the movie proceeds uh which is kind of everything falls down and it kind of shows you well what could have been if if there was kind of a mediation but you have this instance where because one of the challenges here is you know when we thought about you know sealing in this monologue is maybe one day we'll reach this point where you know humans will become enlightened uh whereas uh john uh warns about it in the in the paper we read which is that at uh, every single empire thought that uh and yet they all ended up falling uh so oh, but uh whether or not it can be solved or it couldn't be solved doesn't dismiss the need to try and put in some effort to try and live better lives uh to yes. try to avoid these uh, mimetic viruses and i think this is one of the parts that kind of go into a lot of these movies or warning tales is that and also just the horror movie genre in general which is that that if we you know, yes. do politics there's that flipping of that hierarchy of needs right that then mimetic viruses can actually be incredibly detrimental and squit and spread quickly they can be pandemic so you can have ideological pandemics that spread quickly and those can and one's immune system uh, like being nihilistic will now make you prone to a a mimetic uh, pa uh, parasite or even uh, where it can be a pandemic uh, for revolution. Uh, so you can have an instance here. Oh, so one of the other interesting things about both Metropolis uh, and the Nibelungen, uh, more Metropolis is you very much have a situation where like Antifa and the alt-right, they're just the conservatives who have been ejected from their previous our uh, uh ideolo like ideology or their previous community the community hasn't served anything they have some moral fervor they see some issues like the antifa uh, issue is so crazy because uh the italians were the fascists the germans the nazis were the national socialists and the japanese were the imperialists like all very different ideologies uh and yet they sided um so it's kind of uh, interesting because you end up having things that kind of resemble uh, a, like what you have is authoritarian and then these different streaks of authoritarianism uh, and then Andy Farrell is like yes. yeah we can be authoritarian to kill the authoritarians and or the yeah. all right people where it's like hey let's let's again engage in uh, these issues but then again they it's this is where like freedom fighting kind of becomes an issue and you have the movie uh, 
Dirang Basanti, which is an Indian movie about freedom fighters. And it's also a cautionary tale, even though a lot of people who view it think it's a, a call to action rather than a cautionary tale. Uh, and it's about uh, some impressionable youth learning about freedom fighters and then deciding to be freedom fighters. Uh, and they kind of die as what they thought were martyrs, but in reality, it was just some impressionable youth who did something stupid and then empowered yeah, yeah, exactly. or inspired the nation to then bring forth its own collapse, where then you have uh, situations like Gandhi, which was effective because it tackled uh, the mimetic uh, uh, immune system at a more appropriate uh, uh, issue rather than just a eye for an eye uh, I'll be the judge of, of whether or not you deserve to live. Um, whereas Gandhi does it in terms of well, let's have our ideas battle it out rather than our fists, in which case you can actually have a uh, idea that lives more than just vengeance. That uh, is, that is, I mean, that is, yeah. yes, I just agree because that makes sense. Uh, well, at least to me, but also in, in bigger picture, it does also make sense because, uh, well, because, not because, but as well as. Um, the situations, the situation is a bit warped and um, uh, there was people who tried to, for example, in a short term, like a hundred years, explaining it, for example, um, there was this goody who was a, um, a KGB defector and gave some, some talks for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and he had some talks um, uh, in Los Angeles in 84 he gave several interviews which are on YouTube and I suggest everybody to watch it um, what he does uh, what he does there he he creates an order that explains the situation at hand uh, that was uh, that was happening to a degree and and happening more so today and that which was it was used as a method by KGB to influence other nations and uh, what happened last year is that uh, Activision or Treyarch I think it's Treyarch part or, or Infinity Ward one of those they made a trailer just with the parts of his interview uh, for uh, for a video game called um, Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War I think that's what it is and it came in August the trailer and so Chinese government forced Activision to to eliminate the guy and his messages from the video because they have high purchasing power. And Activision did it. The original trailer is still there by IGN on YouTube. You can watch the original trailer and compare to the one which was... And the comments are full of people who know the whole story. It's like thousands of... Like comments with thousands of likes. Um, like that, hundreds... No, not hundreds, but dozens of thousands of likes. Uh, the, um, on the reality that uh, Chinese party uh, did exactly that which he warned about in the video and that is a huge red pill for example but what he was doing he was actually uh, articulating uh, uh, and sharing the methodology that KGB was employing when undermining uh, nations uh, as, as, as a um, infiltration tool a subversion tool it was, it was not like some James Bond spider stuff it was main ideology subversion and the process he describes step by step the process there are like some papers we can actually discuss you can find in PDF online of these idea of the stages of ideological subversion and um, as he discusses it it follows neatly into understanding of what is happening right now in the West especially in the US so uh, probably like the only Call of Duty game uh, worth playing not it's a it's a worth playing for for its cultural significance and the truthness of the of the of the background plot upon which the game is based is probably modern warfare 2 from 2009 or you can compare it to metal gear metal gear the 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 second metal gear especially there is a conversation between colonel raiden and and somebody else i don't remember and the colonel is not real current was the ai and and the ai says we're not here to control the content which is to the um um is, is, to, not, to not have the the, the uh, control of the speech. We're not here to control the order. Uh, sorry, content. We're here to to the context, and influencing the context will allow you. You. Know, it doesn't matter what you say. If the context, uh, if the context is the, the one which we create for you, what you say does not fit uh, the context. And people's like, will be like, what the hell are you talking about? This makes no sense. But what they say is like, it doesn't make sense in relation to the context of the place we're living in. And 
that is exactly and this was like what just do the game came out with the metal gear solid which is which is why it's a, it's an excellent storyline and i i think hideo and his friend uh, knew more about this than general public wishes to realize or the game wish to realize but it was a, a way to articulate share also a certain type of uh, thing it's a state of the art it is an art video game is is an art form as well but articulating pol political ideas because it's tactical spinach game articulate political ideas global political ideas in such a way and there was there is also discussion of elite and most of, uh, of elites versus non-elites and like so people at the top of the hierarchies versus people who are not at the top of the hierarchies and uh, the, the perception that they have and like most of the games is not the game there is there's you're watching movies as well because there's a lot of cutscenes which like take 10 to 15 to 20 minutes sometimes long it's a ridiculous length you're just you're not only playing game you're also watching movies and there's like a lot of plot and mm, i i recommend everybody to play all the games until the Metal Gear Solid 4, which is the last one. And the other thing, uh, well, well th that's it, is that they try to capture exactly what is going on, is the age of decadence, and the people trying to make up struggle because they have no struggle to do this. And, uh, and this, the Patriots, they're called the Patriots in, in Metal Gear. Uh, they're, they're, they're the Patriots, and they're a, a group of people, a lead group of people who've been for many months in, influencing society at a great scale from from the shadows you know and, uh, the patriots are and and there is uh, debates on the free speech there discussion on the free speech considerations in, in the, and how they influence people and and why they would do it and those things are um attempted as articulating exactly what you articulated as well in 84 probably kojima was aware of that interview uh, or or, or maybe they just uh, independently thought about it because they just noticed uh, and knew used in a different way. Because Bismeno was just talking method which KGB actually used. And Kojima kind of exactly the same method but um, described it in a more artistic form. Like he, he grasped it and tried to explain it in an artistic form. And for that reason, uh, they're excellent, excellent products of thinking. And that explained the current like, 100 last years. Not all of it, and like roughly 100 last years, and how the age of decadence, how especially the West is going through, and what are the manifestations of that. So, uh, yeah, yeah, that's it's it's all very interesting and fascinating. It just takes time to talk and think about, and I'm kind of exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so on the uh, so I've covered uh, two other instances of media, then we'll go through uh, just the last discussion points. Uh, so one of the uh, cases is the TV show Neon Genesis Evangelion, and this one's kind of interesting. Uh, it uh, kind of is the kind of Christian Judgment Day. The uh, angels have come down to kill the sinners and kind of cause that rebirth. Uh, but the humans, uh, there's different political factions, obviously, uh, and uh, mostly the main narrative kind of focuses at least on the narrative of trying to fight the angels so that way hum humans can continue and then there's kind of some twist to the end and the original ending to the tv series was a existentialist reconciliation uh within the main character for his own reasons for living uh as well as the other characters and then that got a lot of backslap back back uh uh what do you call it uh backlash yeah and then they kind of redid the movie with the communist ending where everyone ends up you know, put together in a goo uh, and gets that heavenly rebirth where everyone's kind of all happy and all the rest of the crap, um, rather than actually something where people actually find a meaning to live. Instead, they decide existence is too painful. Let's uh, let's get rid of it all. Uh, now, another more recent uh, efforts of this is the movie Five Centimeters Per Second, uh, Your Name, as well as Weathering With You. They're all by Makoto Shinkai. Uh, and they're all exploring the kind of like a trilogy, in my opinion. So five centimeters per second covers the issue of, uh, or at least articulates the problem of the forgotten individual of a society which love and relationships and family no longer plays a role, and each individual is only cattle for the economy. Uh, and then you have the movie Your Name, which is kind of like, hey, love is actually powerful your impact as an individual even romance or family can actually save a community uh symbolically speaking in the movie but it connects someone with 
with that feeling and it's one of the best grossing films it performed terrifically well it really connected with people and people didn't really know why and what i articulated there i think is why and then he followed this up finally with weathering with you which is well how can you integrate your responsibilities with the society but also this compulsion of finally longing uh for a reconciliation with your human uh needs and wants and desire for family uh, and the movie weathering with you mm -hmm. does a terrific job of combining uh both your obligations with society and this uh also existentialist uh need it it so I kind of view them as a trilogy where he's been exploring this problem for 10 years uh, and 12 years. And he ended up coming to a uh, solution or probably 15 because he would have spent some time writing that. Um, now, the only other resource to mention here that I kind of came up with is this one called The Game of Trust. Uh, so if you go to ncase.me slash trust, it's essentially just a, uh, a game or a, you know, to get the reader to understand uh, game theory and the science of evolution, essentially, uh, and in terms of social evolution. Uh, very good game, uh, worth playing. So to to go through the discussion points, uh, yeah, so I think we see, like, in the West, there's... Just, we have just the age... Yep. About, yep. Just think to end up the discussion about the game. That game uh, bases also consideration on, yep. on the... On the uh, foundation uh, fund, foundations morality theory that's i think it's developed by hayes, hayes and graham i'm not sure though and um, but they wrote a righteous a righteous mind based on their research and they made a meta of the of the of the origins of morality it's not relative morality there's no such thing as moral relativism that and uh, they've been chasing for example franz de Waal, uh, who was a dutch uh, primatologist and they've been studying also Elephants, for example, not only elephants or grapes. And what they have found out, found out is that we share with mammals, we share um, moral foundations such as reciprocity, such as empathy, such as uh, cooperation. And there is one more. It's like he calls this morality fund fairness. That's the one. Morality foundation theory. And there's like a tattoo of his by Franz de Waal, if you look on YouTube, for example, where they did an experiment with monkeys. And it's like the monkeys in the cage, and and they have a task they, they're given a stone and they have to give back the stage and i invite um it it explains very well how it has nothing to do with where you come from the culture it has nothing to do with upbringing it's it's very it's more ancient ancient than that and uh, other primates that don't have these complex cultures and and trees and traditions and whatnot they will share those um sentiments as us um, and then so for example the, the monkeys you know you can actually find a video if you find a video on youtube it's like a two it's, it's a one or two minute clip and it will show what monkeys do but uh, i can I, I can tell them otherwise so, um you give a stone to a monkey as he back he re receives a chunk of a grape uh, a chunk of a, a cucumber and then the other monkey is given a stone in another part of the cage and then it pick up the stone and gives it back to the researcher and 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 and, it, and receives a piece of cucumber and so what happens then is that the first monkey again is given the stone and the monkey gives it back and it receives cucumber and then and then the second monkey uh, gives gives the gives the um, stone back and receives a grape in this case no longer a cucumber a grape and so what happens is that uh, the first monkey the first monkey sees that and then it, it takes the stone and gives to the researcher and receives again the cucumber and it's like okay we're doing the same shit but we're cucumber so what it does it doesn't even eat it it arm out of the cage and throws the chunk of cucumber at the researcher and it has nothing to do with your equality is is way beyond uh, any ideological consideration it's way it's much it's ancient thing because it is one of the mechanisms by which we exist as a, as a group um a reproductive group we exist, like in a tribe if you don't if everybody fights if you don't cooperate uh, nobody wins so so for example that, and that is why something like nuclear weaponry is like everybody fights so you better cooperate and for that reason uh, only lower order fighting exists such as economic warfare or biological warfare 
very probably, that you cannot really point finger at who is doing it, but you cannot go nuclear, full out nuclear, because it will be a uh, game over for everybody. It's reciprocity and fairness, like, you do this to me, I do this to you, you know, and uh, I think that is a chance or delay in, in the, in the degra degradation of a society, because it will not be invaded or overtaken by somebody. The structure of a society will exist, maybe the people will change, the migration can infect it, but the violent overtake, military overtake will not happen, there will not be expansion of China into the US, because nukes prevent that, you know. And so there yeah. is this. Uh, we will be we will be a smoldering in in the age of decadence until there is either a solution or we just keep smoldering. And we do what? We go for World War Three. And Einstein, for example, he applied the same logic as as for example, um, any, uh, Gene Rodden about Star Trek. Is that there was World War Three, which was nuclear. And uh, so the logic for us always says we go to war eventually. But with nukes, you cannot go to war eventually. But it dies, or most of people die. So actually nuclear disarmament, disarmament is dangerous because it will increase the chances of using nukes because not everybody will die. People will think that not everybody will die. And um, that is exactly the same with fair is, reciprocity is exactly the same thing with cucumber and grape but on more on higher level. But the mechanism is ancient. It has nothing to do with cultures. It has nothing to do with ideological considerations. It has. It is our biology driven uh, evolutionary thing that makes us behave in a certain way and it's like elephants cooperating and the cheating for example in this game the cheating there are two elephants there is a thing with tree behind the fence and there is like two ropes and both elephants have to pull both ropes at the same time to reach the treats and so uh, what they, what they use video is that one of both elephants cooperate but one of the elephants found out that he can cheat so what he does he just put leg on the rope and just another elephant puts pulls the rope by, by himself but both get access to the treatment and researchers said we did not teach the elephant to do that he figured out on him he can just put the leg on the rope because because what happens if only one of them pulls the rope the rope will just escape from the other one in behind the fence and so they won't be able to pull it. they have to work together you know but one elephant learns that if i put the leg i don't even have to do much effort it's called freeloading or in economic terms it's called free riding um, and yeah. it, and it's not it's not it's not it's not made up concept by some economists no it is discovered a mechanism that existed that exists in elephants but elephants don't have keynesian international monetary system system they don't have that they're just freaking elephants and they have our own uh, system, but the mechanism is so true. they also have it a mechanism is not made up by us mechanism did long before we found out about it and yeah. the cheat or cooperate it's and shared yeah 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 it's a fair uh, fair summary so we've got a uh... So yeah, with the USA, I think yeah, it's age of intellect, uh, probably from the 1950s up to until around like 2010. There's also overlap of the ages. Uh, you know, there's a shared between it, and the share kind of expands in that kind of progression. And I think yeah, then it went age of affluenza, uh, and now it mm -hmm. could probably be in the age of decline, uh, which is also aligns with Turchin's work to say that. From 2010 to 2050, uh, there will be a, a those data uh, seems to show from the amount of domestic terrorism that is occurring uh, that we're now in the decline stage. In which case, uh, yeah, there's now the seeking for something else. But one of the things that uh, John Glubb uh, warns about is that often uh, it's an external uh nation that actually then colonizes uh the declining nation uh which is something that usa should be particularly concerned about but then again these days we have a new uh category of empire which is the company or the corporation uh so we now we have facebook and google and one on and and this can this is a new threat uh that wasn't necessarily the case uh prior um so when we also look at china it's kind of interesting uh because they had a revolution around 1950 so now uh it's like okay they're probably in the integration phase where they're now uh doing uh they they've gone from age of commerce and now they're going into age of intellect uh or yeah they're probably going now into this phase now unless we want to 
decide that they're also yeah they're probably going in that phase of going to use this um okay so anthropology crossovers uh these are just some observations or connections i don't particularly hold them they're just interesting ideas that you know tie in with all the other stuff we've kind of read or talked about or you know encountered uh so yeah without politics fitness matures from individual to family to state uh so you have a dependent child an independent adult uh and the role of parents is to initially for the mother to nurture the dependent child this is just breastfeeding obviously and um, protect the child uh, and then the father separates the child from mother there's also some resentment freud talked a lot about this but he empowers the child to overcome. And I originally had win there, but I think it's about overcome. It's about always overcoming an obstacle, uh, their own self-deficiencies or the deficiencies of the environment. Um, because single mothers they have an issue where uh, they don't particularly discipline and they like to keep the child around as an additional provider. Um, so what happens is the child fails to develop into an independent adult and they become the husband of the mother. Uh, that is not a particularly good direction for a society uh, because it robs the trend, uh, the, the uh, developmental progress of a nation. Uh, so the other that's also the issue inherently with statutory rape, which is that if you have like say a 15 year old boy consenting with sex with a 20 year old girl, uh, you now rob that boy from same time period experiences that would normally get him to uh, develop correctly, uh, which is a family with someone uh, his own age, love with someone uh, his own age, uh, things like that. Whereas jumping immediately to an older thing uh, can have long lasting sociological effects on that boy's uh, life. So statutory rape, as much as Camille Paglia likes uh, and Nambla likes the idea of pedophilia um, or even statutory rape with teenagers. Uh, it is terrible for the outcomes of a nation. It's another state of decadence. Um, so politics emerges, conquers family, religious anarchy, becomes a tool for wish making. So this is where we have that inversion of the hierarchy of needs where ideological viruses can now, ideology can now promise or even to an extent obtain uh the meaning of needs so it becomes the uh, the tool of politics rather than actually the tool of one's own agency uh to fulfill their physiological needs or even their uh their the their psychological needs or fulfillment needs uh you know the more one becomes an ideologue the more of their needs they are now sustaining through ideology um and the more dangerous they essentially are so People wish for vindication, not redemption. This is another thing with coping. It's also very difficult for people to move even though the sky goes into this. So you have politicians kind of just like, hey, you don't actually have to work for it. We can achieve it, just vote for us. Uh, so this is vindication without redemption. Uh, so uh, you have the have-nots plunder the haves regardless of causation of the differences. Uh, so this is a kind of a ethic of, uh, you don't really have to work for it. Everyone should get the fairness to survive, uh, which then allows easy exploitation by freeloaders and free riders. Uh, it is not a sustainable strategy, um, which is why it doesn't last long. So action's no longer. Yeah, no, it's not. It's yeah. not. But uh, it will be fun in the so-called age of meaning, age of meaninglessness. Right. Or age of meaning, age of meaning, I guess. Or yeah, age of struggle. <laughs> age of yeah, affluenza uh, is interesting. Yeah, affluenza. If you go to the Wikipedia page for affluenza, it's like the uh, diseases of affluence. Mm. So. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. People, I mean, uh, I don't know the, what it, what it does generally to a person who realize because these things you don't just accept these things. I mean, it's hard to accept these things because and generally you come to these realizations unwillingly or you didn't ask for it it just happened to you and it's like well shit <laughs> and what happens normally you're very not depressive but you're like it's it's sad but you also realize the amount of work you have to be doing and it's not talking you cannot just well it is talking but not only you there is a lot of action that needs to be done and it's um it's mind-boggling endeavor and there, this that's why I was um, thinking of the methodology, but an ideology that is somewhat of a method. It's an ideology that allows people exactly f to to understand that. Is that the the once they uh, once they understand it, uh, they well they will be able to per 
perpetually improve their understanding of other things. Right. Now, it's it kind of really like uh, ideology without practice is politics, right? Like yeah, yeah, ideology yeah. with practice is a discipline and ideology yes. without practice is politics. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because if there is no actions that you have to do, you, you, you well, you just talk, right? And, and that's what we have nowadays. We just have politics. Everything is politicized. Everybody talks about everything and nothing is being done. Nothing will be done because everybody is so... Uh, they're, they're trying to maintain the levers of influence by, uh, by retaining their verbal, uh, verbal diarrhea at a higher ranking uh, by the biggest majority of people than of their opponent. And that's not fruitful whatsoever because mm, that, it doesn't lead to anything. A thought is a thought, but when you bounce it against the reality, when you test it out in the real world, when you act it out, and the reality is like, well, it doesn't really work. It's like, okay, so the original idea wasn't really good. So, so actually, theoretical hypothesis testing is very dangerous, pernicious, and falling for it is very dangerous because um, some of it might not be even useful for the world. Like for the, we don't, I don't care. Uh, uh, for the hypothesis testing of a black hole because on the planet there are no black holes and so you there is no usability for the black hole on the planet i mean i get it but you cannot really test it and it doesn't really matter why should we spend time this debating or discussing this thing or even we can do it but not as overwhelmingly and making like an important political thing to support the physics departments. Uh, I'm mean, like, okay, if it's for the black holes, uh, sure. But, but let's say it's asteroids or or or, or space, uh, have something to do with space like astrophysics or astrodynamics. Uh, that is important uh, to to promote, for example, uh, because you can physically test it. You send a spaceship into the space, and you see if your t if your hypothesis uh, is valid or not, because it either crashes or it either succeeds as way you did and whatnot. And that's what Elon is doing, for example, with the rockets, because he he's testing the hypothesis. He's not, well, if we have all these mathematics right, and the weather is this way, the model says the the rocket will land back normally. No, because they have to do it, and it failed because there are other things which they weren't considering. You know. Um, and when we have to test our thinking against the reality, if we don't test thinking against the reality, we we run a huge possibility of just being wrong and just living it out until we cannot ignore anymore the reality. And by then it is such a huge contrast between that which we believe and that what actually is, that when the two things counteract one another, it's a very huge internal conflict and external conflict. It's like a matter and antimatter. It will be a huge explosion. And you don't want to have this uh, contrast because high contrast is dangerous. And people don't seem to, well, they're generally not aware. It's not that they're stupid that they can get it. I think they can get it. A majority of people can get it because it's not difficult. But they're just not aware of these things which they have to think about. And it is something different. So, yes. So, yeah, so we have, uh, uh, yeah, when actions, they no longer be redemptive. So this is, yeah, without practice. So then uh, have nots no longer become individually responsible to become a have. Uh, and I one of the interesting patterns I see uh, is conquered people desire to be treated as children uh, rather than necessarily the state. Um, and I think it's because as well as, you know, through history, you have, it's, if there hasn't been a direct trajectory from a uh, individual like child to adult in terms of let's say the modern conception of adult which is you know true in eastern and western philosophy if we take a more barbarian uh culture there isn't really a clear distinction and then they have now conquered embedded within a uh, a modern uh civilization an actual civilization not just a bunch of tribes uh, and because they haven't had that tra transgression, it, you know, the, the case of the minimal uh, uh, effort required to achieve maximum result or like the minimum effort uh, is to just ask for things, say, I'm vulnerable, treat me as a child. And that's also met by welcome arms because they're viewed as the have nots or as the oppressed and the rest. Uh, so uh, instead of it saying, please release me so I can have my agency, leave me alone, yes. I am capable. Uh, which you also see uh, is actually also humanized just... by their peers as well. You have a few people okay. who say, let me break out from this mm -hmm. these, these harmful traditions and claim mm -hmm. my spot uh, as an individual in the modern world. And they get, mm -hmm. you know, called a cracker or a, uh, 
whitey or trader or you know race trader or all the rest uh and you the know crab it's mentality. Hard. yes yes the crab in the bucket mentality yes yes but uh, the other thing is that the other reason why they cannot be responsible or agent of themselves is because they don't have the opportunity the opportunity are saturated right. the economy is saturated there is not many the economy does not grow as much as the jobs uh, sorry as the population and so there needs to be either fragmentation of a task into sm smaller jobs so you don't have to be as smart to do them because they're simpler tasks um because one once one person who is more educated and smarter can do more different tasks as one uh, occupation professional occupation <laughs> but if there is many people not everybody can get it so the competition is high and then you have academic inflation to try to counteract it right. and the issue with that is that they also the wealth inequality that you there is no social mobility so you have to do higher and higher you 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 study and study more and you do more internships and whatnot to get less and less and millennials and zoomers will be the, the generation who will be the poor, poorer than their parents the first yeah. generation to be poor it's, parents. it's, it's kind of like the uh the quality quality of material life improves uh however you know from the rising tides however what doesn't improve is the opportunity as you say and and the reason why uh, is because it's been alluded to a bit, but the reason why is the barrier of entry increases. So, for instance, even for streaming, right? Like you know, back uh, ten years ago when YouTube first started, you could just do it basically on a laptop with a shitty camera. Uh, but now, you know, even for this, like I've got a good, you know, fairly okay camera, fairly okay microphone. You know, got mm -hmm. the green screen now, the lights and everything. And, but, you know, also a laptop and all this, like, you know, someone just in Asia who's going from peasantry to technology, uh, they can't even afford uh, this barrier to entry. Uh, and even modern computing, like, you know, before tech, you know, it was just word processing, you didn't need that much, but even yeah, the yeah. basic applications require more and more. And this is one of the issues, which is like affluence ends up sustaining itself through like the conspicuous consumption. And then people look at that as the signs of status or of authority. Uh, as we should listen to you. And also, if it's also serving as entertainment, it's more pretty, there's more things to keep us going. Like a MKBHD thing, like his cameras are like $40,000 and he's got a whole bunch and then the arms and yeah, everything yeah, yeah. Which is why, right? which is exactly what means money means more speech. Because if you have, nowadays, if you have more money, you can, well, you, you can afford all of those things and it will be more appealing to watch and therefore more people will listen to you and you can influence them just, just because of that. So there is, of course, advantages. We, those are all barriers. They're all barriers that always existed and um, regardless of the system, they will still exist. They existed in Soviet Union. They were emerging in the Soviet Union. They exist now in uh, capitalist societies. It has nothing to do with one system or another. It is an inherent issue that we have from uh, being humans in, in biological terms and how these simple and rudimentary mechanisms, how they affect our thinking, how we behave and we not, not notice and then we just, uh, ego just tells us, oh, it's these guys, it's not me, it's you and it's not you, it's me um, and it's an ideology, it's not something else. Right. And it's very, it's a very pernicious, very dangerous path and yeah. people, they, they cannot abstract themselves from it. They're so absorbed by the ideologies which hold them that... Uh, and some ideologies go for the very basic of thinking, like you yeah. know what, what it means to think. It's like okay, yeah, there we yeah, yeah. Because it's not, it's not just like even a lack of uh, like uh, uh, material possessions that's also a barrier to entry. It's also like a mimetic legacy. Like which memes are you operating on, and are they compatible with the status quo? So, for instance, like a repressed nation, like one that was under occupations. Uh, their population has developed a culture and ethic where, you know, through uh, through evolutionary morality or moral economics, that it is not okay to question authority. It is not okay to ask why. You are yes. only to obey. Yes. And there goes their ability to be creative. You've just eliminated their ability to understand the entire hierarchy of interactions of the world. Because what happens now is, you know, you ask why, and then they look puzzled and their entire axiom world cripples at just a simple, like a single instance of that invocation, mm -hmm. that question. Mm -hmm. uh, and you then end up as a, a repressed individual, as a why asker against people who now hold the power, who just follow orders. But you also end up with a crippling state where because everyone is too concerned to ever tell the boss this wouldn't work because they're only there to nod heads and say, yes, sir. 
uh, bad ideas end up proliferating and costing a lot of money. And then that nation again becomes vulnerable to uh, exploitation. That's part of the liberal rev revolution um, mm. to kind of engage in that ideas. But then the liberal revolution became exploited uh, by its own desire to liberate people. It then became exploited by those that liberates, I guess. Um, yeah. yeah. Because again, not being aware of the full extent of their of their uh, uh, innate mechanisms that uh, that influence our behaviors, and it's like, well, I'm aware of these ones, and I've found the system which will allow me to improve that for others too. And it's like, well, what about the other two or the other three? And the person might not be aware of that, and so they do something. Oh, it kind of works. It's okay. So we can ease off gas, and uh, that's when more un uh, things you're unaware of um, that get into it um, and start having its effect. And the the original idea starts slowly being warped and you think it's progress and yada yada and by the time you realize it's too late and everything is horribly different from what you've imagined and these things can move extremely quickly and it's very it's very uh, that's that's what i'm saying there should be a, not only method of thinking but a form of an ideology which allows person to be aware of this of this uh behavioral pattern so Technically, what you want is perpetual education ideology or edu ideology that promotes perpetual education. That is one of the tenets that should be one. And in his paper, he actually mentioned something. Just a moment. At the end, he was like suggesting a possible solutions uh, or what are my considerations, where he was mentioning, aha, uh, uh -huh. for example, he says here on page 23, uh, perhaps if the pattern of the rise and fall of nations were regularly taught in schools, the general public would come to realize the truth and would support policies to maintain the spirit of duty and self-sacrifice and to forestall the accumulation of excessive wealth by one nation, leading to demoralization of that nation, which means basically low taxes on many is uh, low taxes on many. Low taxes on many is death. So, but here I mean the, the wealth especially. And you had this guy, his name was R R Rutger Bregman or something like this. He wrote a book, which I remember has an orange cover and he was invited to Davos by billionaires well most of billionaires and influential people and they expected him to to give them a bit of uh, um, uh, beauty speak I call it beauty speak it's like everybody feels good but nothing being done and just to fill in the gap and what he did he just he just came in and just said taxes 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 and although he promotes such ideas as UBI and whatnot his original understanding is correct because taxation on the and he meant taxes on the rich and the importance is that because while he understands the the the, the issue of, of the inequality and how more wealth allows you to accumulate even more wealth much much more easily, um, he understands that the only way to 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 revert the issue would be through taxation in current uh, situation in current uh, legislative economic system, um, and and it was not very welcome. Let's say <laughs> you can watch his talk uh, Davos on YouTube. Uh, I think he's he's Bergman Ber Bergman or Bregman. I think Bregman. Ginger Folk. Oh, he was also invited to to talk to what's his name uh, from Fox News, the the Tucker Carlson, and it wasn't aired. But Bregman also filmed it uh, like behind the scenes, and it's also on YouTube. You can watch because uh, he accused Tucker of exactly the same. He called him a rich millionaire who's working for billionaires, talking for the conservative middle class, and 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 Tucker like lost his shit. It's also on YouTube. You can find. It's pretty hilarious. So while you might not agree with the ideas of this guy, what he talks about taxation on the rich is, is he pinpoints correctly the issue at hand right now. But the thing is, and, and, and sadly taxation on the rich is the solution to it. Um, now the other thing what, what uh, Glob was referring is, men bursting with courage, energy and self-confidence cannot easily be restrained from subduing their neighbors, and men who see the prospect of wealth open to them will not readily be prevented from pursuing it. This is like, Excellent, excellent um, topic, but there needs to be a reconciliation. And I'm thinking he also offers here reconciliation. Perhaps it is not in the real interest of humanity that they should be pre so prevented. Mm, for it is in periods of wealth that art, architecture, music, science, and literature make the greatest progress. But also there is an issue where he says, 
Could not the sense of duty and the initiative needed to give rise to action be retained parallel with intellectual development and discoveries of natural sciences? And here, it dawned upon me, there was an idea like this, and it was written by Robert Heinlein, uh, Richard Robert, Robert Heinlein, I think it's Robert Heinlein, with his Starship Troopers. And in Starship Troopers is exactly that, is that to become the citizen, you serve in the military. You can still be a rich bastard, but you are not the citizen. Uh, you, you, you're still wealthy, you're still rich, and you still have all your comforts and intellectualism, but you are not, uh, but you are not a citizen until you've served in the military. So sense of duty and self-sacrifice. And Starship Troopers is shows that because the main character, Johnny Rico, is a family of uh, uh, they're not citizens they're civilians their family or they're rich he comes from a rich family and he enlists in the in the military because he wants to become a citizen so he wants to have influence on the society on his nation as a whole which at the time is a planetary nation and so here when that's what exactly what just popped out of my mind is that Heinlein was trying to articulate something similar by saying that you can have both by divor diverse, uh, sorry, divorcing economy from politics the same way you divorced uh, religion from politics. So when you secularized the, the Western uh, nations, you could also do the same with the economics. You can separate it. You will still be economical, but economics should have zero impact on political decisions, on the, on the things which affect society at large. So you can still be wealthy, but your wealth will not jeopardize the, the social stability or Order, and that things that matter will still matter. They will not be ignored or forgotten or taken for granted because there will be obligation to pass certain trials to understand what it means to be responsible for the lives of others. And the best way to do it is to go through the military service because mm. when somebody dies or, or, you, or you have to kill somebody or somebody tries to kill you, the understanding of what it means, the value of life and what it means to make decisions becomes yeah. uh, impossible to ignore. Well, you, you, what is... Well, at, to some extent, right, like that's the Swiss and uh, South Korea model, right? Like the men uh, still have to serve in the military there and, and they've done tremendously well. Uh, but at the same time, you also have a situation like Taiwan where uh, people don't really receive the correct training and all the rest. So I think like in terms of the ritual of turning someone into a integrated, like essentially that's what like mandatory service is. It's a enforced ritual upon the population. And... I think that's been completely dismissed uh, uh, and a type of enforced ritual and enforced experience. And because otherwise you do allow the complete degradation of a culture into just fractioning subcultures. And he gave the two warnings, right? Which is that uh, kind of dissuading men from oppressing or, you know, mankind from oppressing another nation, which is weaker, is difficult as well as uh, persuading, uh, you know, an opportunist from seeking monetary gain is also difficult. There should be another one for the modern world, which is to uh, uh, dissuade one for using the government to meet their own needs at the expense of another uh, should also be one of the other concerns that uh, kind of these rituals need to kind of be embodied, embodied around perhaps. I mean, that's like the speculation. He just gave like some warnings and some uh some concerns and then these are like uh conjectures on top of it um all right uh shall i shall i move on with the, the dot points sure go ahead all right so one of the other notes here and uh the politics and like the role of politics uh in this situation is in that inverted pyramid is uh republicanism and conservatism it's kind of like a monotheistic tool for mas masculine discipline uh, exploited by the resentment of the, so right, he talks about this homogenous uh, stage, which is like the age of resolution and the age of expansion and age of commerce, and then it eventually turns in affluence. These are kind of all conservatism, uh, and then you eventually have this liberal uh, uh, decadence kind of side here. And I think what happens is. Uh, they're kind of essentially monotheistic. The nation revolves around one god, be it symbolic or, or a deity, uh, and you actually get homogeny uh, that way regardless of ethnic lines, right? You have one essentially race or one culture, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, so it's essentially monotheistic. Uh, and then, but it's exploited by then people who, uh, uh, had, had, you know, didn't, get the correct opportunity, made some mistakes, mm -hmm. or their parents or their peers made some mistakes and dragged them into hell, right? And then the, um, the... One thing to add. 
Uh, sorry for interjecting. Yeah. Just one thing to add is that a consider, a consider funny uh, data is that what I found out, if, if only men were allowed to vote in American elections 2016, 2020, uh, Trump would win. If only women would be allowed to vote, uh, Hillary would win or Biden would win. And right. that is an interesting consideration also to to add to this, because you said monotheism tool for masculine discipline, and liberalism therefore would be monotheism tool for feminine discipline, I would say. And uh, roughly the balance between the two is we have. And that is an interesting dynamic. Anyhow, continue. continue. Yeah. Uh, so do you have the uh, the resentment issue, and that's kind of it's where it's exploited or it's vulnerable. And then it ends up foundering into liberalism uh, once people become comfortable, and when things become comfortable, then uh, things open up. Uh, and Glob also talked about, and then when things open up, uh, uh, you also you have a whole array of things that I'm not going to go into then. But essentially what you then have is, is the monotheistic thing turns into polytheistic. You now allow subcultures. Uh, but as long as those subcultures are still within one nation, they're going to start battling for the power of that democracy. And that's where it kind of gets a little bit uh, interesting because there is a difference between the empires you categorize. There's a great YouTube channel. Uh, I linked it at the start here. Um, uh, this one is YouTube actually going to load. Yeah. Uh, captivating history. So they do like these little 10 minute videos on like empires. They're like start and the following kind of what was unique about them. Uh, and so there is a difference between kind of the empires he outlined because not all the times were the nation states when they became uh, subjected to a new empire uh, was a complete oppression. A lot of the times it was just, hey, you're now under our protection as long as we engage in trade. When other times like Genghis mm -hmm. Khan, it's like, let's kill all the males and rape all the women. So a lot of the times uh, the, it was actually kind of bringing everyone home into one uh, family house or one family. Corporation. And then other it's times it was exactly a corporation. eradication. Right. Exactly. It was right. more so I of a corporation. Uh, or generally, uh, so, sorry, it's generally corporation rather than, than, than competition in this end, uh, in the sense. And if it's competition, it doesn't work out because one will just eliminate the other. And one of the models of that we're doing, uh, but continue, continue. Right, so one of the issues with uh, modern government is the issue of democracy. And uh, is the democracy has no weaknesses, it's no not to survive after a, a while, for the exact same reason every single time, which is that the you have a gun, which is the government, and then you have tribes battling for power of that gun. Uh, to get their own needs, and then you have politicians which exploit the people's intuitions and worse aspects. Uh, so uh, that's kind of what Liberty and John Stuart Mill started talking about, which is, hey, let's put some curbs on this. Uh, so there is like a new meme uh, that's in the day here, which could actually be where uh, nation states may actually be able, like he also talked in the book about the EU and kind of some hopes for the EU as well as some skepticism in terms of let's have in nation states, but then still under some uh, commonalities like uh, protection as well as trade uh, and also some like digital rights enforcement, things like that. So now we're kind of, you know, tackling like adding a new layer of complexity or sophistication in how can we evolve this dynamic? Uh, so rather than it always being a bloodshed uh, conquering, it can actually be a united cooperation uh, under a shared telos. Uh, but under the, like right now in the USA, uh, it doesn't seem to fare that well uh, with democracies. Eventually, they, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you just end up with a lot of domestic terrorism until someone gets their way. Um, so yeah, hopefully, yeah. and that's just been time. So hopefully there's some new innovation to have here. Um, but you see it, I've defined it here as polytheistic and it's kind of exploited by a uh, uh, kind of collectivism and compassion. Uh, they're kind of the two mm -hmm. exploitations of it. So society becomes divided by the feminine worldview of two groups. Those who need nurture, the have-nots, the children, the oppressed, the unfortunate, the marginalized, and then those who should provide nurture. Not necessarily themselves, mm -hmm. but you should be providing nurture to those who need it. Uh, so they have yes, the yes. fathers, the husbands, the mothers, the wealthy, the fortune, the privileged. Never the children should see, take care no, of the children. Exactly. It's, it's not self-reflective behavior. You reflect the behavior of others, which is called criticism, but you're not reflecting upon your your own role of reflection. And of course, some of those say, hey, hey, we're 
they're actually doing it and um, ideologies which try to but the thing is that uh, they do not apply it what they they say it about us and about not about themselves and it, it is it, because of the vagueness there's no concreteness upon which you can um, make distinctions and because of that uh, their own arguments fall flat and that's another problem with some sort of ideos some ideologies which i mentioned previously already right we've seen it yeah but yeah uh so so kind of the uh the the put labels on it as toxic charity and toxic harmony mm -hmm. uh pause mm -hmm. and select uh, is like an essayist uh youtube channel they did a great essay on like uh at three parts of like uh japanese cinema uh about how it's evolution over the decades kind of dealing with uh at some point they tackle the issue of toxic harmony it's kind of fascinating but i think essentially what you have is like around warring times like this this uh this time of the expansion sociopathy works really well but not so necessarily machiavellian and narcissism they work really well when you have an established rule game and then people can kind of exploit it uh, whereas yes. sociopathy yes. is just a violent revolution, whereas these other ones, they thrive in like the liberal landscape of business, welfare and entertainment, the whole spectrum of psychopathy. Yes. Uh, so then you have the exploitation of trust, that game kind of goes into it. You also have neoteny and compassion exploited, uh, like people looking after pets rather than children. Uh, insensible sensitivities do not meet maturation via discipline and shame. So this is like, can, because you don't wish to offend someone, you will let them engage in a life of self-harm. Uh, uh, and then winning no longer celebrated, but turned upon as a sign of corruption. Uh, this yes. is again, like a lack everybody of- Everybody gets, uh, everybody should get a medal. Yes. Yeah. No, but then no one is strong enough to call. defend everybody themselves should. from, from vicious. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Uh, and then expanding distrust wears away the social fabric. So as you, as the society goes into decadence, then distrust goes high. And you see this even with Sydney. Uh, Sydney people has don't become think a low trust trust people city. Think, exactly. That's exactly it. Because yeah. trust is uh, the pillars, uh, as Franz Duval was looking, for example, the pillars of morality were, were fairness and reciprocity as the two big things. And as fairness decreases, as inequality increases, fairness decreases and reciprocity so does too. And so people stopped. And, and that was the pillars also of trust and people stop trusting one another because and um, it's not fair things are not fair and um, nobody wants to help others nobody's cooperative nobody's altruistic people are even more competitive with each other's throats so yeah yeah it's right. being distrust yeah so like for example that like in a city if you say hi to a stranger as you're walking by and it's low trust they'll completely ignore you uh, whereas in a high trust society, they'll continue talking or even in a high trust, uh, homogenous, homogenous, uh, society, uh, then they will probably invite you in for a coffee, uh, or, you know, depending on what the ethic is. Yeah. So yeah, even, yeah. It's exactly the same with yeah. 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 It's a small country, so even a with, small village. Yeah. Yeah. So with, uh, like that, it, it's kind of interesting with like the book, the Odyssey kind of really illustrates the differences between cultures, uh, by Homer, uh, in terms of trust and low trust. Uh, so, okay. So what's new this time? We've got intergeneration history keeping, uh, now the everyday person has literacy. They're now able to talk to people once we're long and dead. Um, so this is going to be interesting for the next empires. They could learn a lot from our failures. Uh, capitalism, that's still old. Capitalism has been around for thousands of years, despite people thinking it's new. But uh, liberty is somewhat new, not necessarily. The Zoroastrians were like the Persian Empire was a very liber liberal uh, society, um, but they didn't have any unified uh, military uh, to kind of protect them. It was just kind of like a, an empire around trade, but not really an empire around defense as well. So they got exploited by the Romans. Yes. Uh, yes. So liberty. Uh, the modern version of it by John Stuart Mill and the rest where it's like, hey, let's put some keeps, some checks and balances on liberal society uh, seems to be somewhat very new, weird, be it either, either checks and balances on a liberal nation or whether or not yes. it becomes its own libertarian nation like Liberland is attempting. Exactly. And so, so commercial nations, commercial nations which, which want to protect themselves now can invest in new only and that would be already very very useful for them oh, because right. they don't have to do anything else because nukes prevent uh, that uh, like if persian had nukes i doubt that they would get invaded they could have stayed commercial society mm, i mean well uh, iran yeah. still trying to get the 
nukes, but uh, American government doesn't want nukes as well. <laughs> Pakistan has the nukes, India has nukes, what, France has nukes, UK has nukes. Uh, these kind, the nuclear powers will not get invaded. Uh, I think uh, if they do, it will be World War Three, and then we'll have Star Trek dystopia style, you know, right. that everybody envisioned. But it's something nobody wants to price you high. It's probably like the way to maybe solve this as an individual level, which is just imagine everyone has a nuke. How do you prevent them from pressing the button, right? That's kind of like the the challenge, like the uh, the measuring stick, the yardstick for uh, how to sustain an empire, I guess. That's that's why that's why you, what you want. Nuke. Exactly. That's why what you want in the type of ideology is that ideology to developing should be a nuclear bomb in terms of that that it cannot if you use it against somebody itself will suffer and that is the kind of ideology you want because then nobody will be able to use that ideology uh, at the dispense of other person um, which is the concept of nuclear proliferation like because nowadays you can use that and escape uh, with some means from it but uh, like just like with nuclear weapons an ideology which allows you to uh, intellectually prevent people from harming others without uh, severe, almost eliminating consequences for themselves. Now that uh, is something to be quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, so we've got a, a quote by John Glob uh, here, which was the um, past empires show almost every possible variation of political system, but all go through the same procedure from the age of pioneers through conquest, commerce, affluence to decline and collapse. So, it, we should also be skeptical that politics alone can solve this uh, this cycle. Uh, exactly. That's his warning here. Exactly. So need for work has diminished, uh, but it has also done that previously with booming agricultural societies. So how can we solve the boredom mm -hmm. without succumbing to entertainment? Was that what philosophy tried to do? Is philosophy actually accessible to all? Can we get proper diversity respect rather than just diversity assimilation? And John has written, instead, at this moment of declining trade and financial stringency, the people of Baghdad introduced the five-day week. So they actually got lazier. So one of the yes. issues uh, here is uh, uh, a lot of the times, uh, you know, if you do, you know, go back to the hierarchy of needs, right, is, um, where was it? Uh, here, which is a lot of times if, you know, they're not getting the needs met or the more needs met and then you say okay well you got to do these strategies do this you know you're also being affected by these external patterns and what's happening in china right now and the recession and all the COVID, and you know whoever's president then you're going to blow the average person out in the capabilities of dealing with that and then when there's a politician who says vote for me i will solve your needs uh they're probably just going to do that it's it's way easier way more accessible uh, so you have an issue here where, where, kind of philosophy as or as accessible as politics to the person, um, and that does not seem like it's ever going to happen. I'm so skeptical of that. It seems like it's needed. Uh, however, <laughs> to the extent it's possible, is highly doubtful. <laughs> so. Uh, just because there's an infinite amount of things to know about how you're impacted. Uh, and the more complex society gets, the more things that impact you. So, and also the more powerful the upper class gets. Like a lot of times, as I wrote in that blog post where socialism fits, uh, a lot of times, sometimes revolution is just necessary. Um, so yes. that's another interesting thought for you know a whole bunch of researchers to explore sociology. More so, more so. I can tell you that I can tell you that this is more of a finite. <laughs> Um, the paradigm shift, the idea of paradigm shift, the paradigm and then the revolution and then shift to a new paradigm. It's, uh, it's, a f it's a finite conceptualization because infinite players uh, who are generally uh, upper echelons of hierarchies, of, all, of any hierarchies where they are, they realize that you're not playing with the boundaries because paradigm has boundaries and that is finite mindset. They play with the boundaries always, so they never, sh they never shift another paradigm. They they either expand the borders of the current paradigm in which they live um, or which they inhabit, uh, or they like re redefine and include another paradigm. But for finite members, like, no, 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 no. Uh, this thing and this thing are separate. And to get from one to another, we need this uh, violent change of order, which is generally through revolution. Um, and uh, this is the difference between finite and infinite players. The infinite players don't do is like, no, 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 no. You can just adjust. You can be flexible. And these are the ways how you can do it in more pragmatic, non-violent uh, way. 
Okay. Well, I, I remember one of the things about that infinite game thing. I, I think there's another angle to what you mentioned about that uh, earlier, which is that, um, it, so for instance, like stock trading is considered like a zero sum game, right? Because when you buy a stock, someone else is losing if you're making money. However, that's not necessarily the case because I think with any limited game, it's also about the awareness of the, the, the uh, not the ecosystem, the ecology of that specific game there's always a, a branch out so for instance like uh stock yeah. investing is actually moving money from bad investments to better investments so it's actually saying hey let's take all this money from wake from companies who no longer deserve it and give it to companies who now can move faster with more innovation with that money and if okay, you were yes. funding companies who don't deserve it anymore well you're a bad move i'm going to get rewarded for funding companies who deserve the money more than you and that's kind of like the game. So it's, it's like it's zero sum, like zero sum games is like it's kind of somewhat a little bit shallow and egotistical because I tend, I, I kind of think that it's always just a matter of to what level you're constraining or abstraction of the way you look at it. Yes, yes, exactly. Because at the you realize that uh, infinite game games and the people who really are infinite players therefore and people who don't realize that they're not they they come into military they love receiving ranks uh, mm. people go into politics they like to progress in their career people who go into medicine they like to become from a student to become a doctor those are all games finite games right and people who like football uh, they, they the beginning of the game the end of the game, there are the rules the the winning or losing they they they, they subscribe to the rule and they never think about about it uh, in a in disassociated wave a way uh, for them it's all different finite games and uh and then there is smaller finite games and bigger finite games. And, and the infinite game is realizing that they are all changeable and manipulatable. That is more of an infinite mindset. And that they all are within this huge infinite game. And you can, to a degree, call it life. But Cold War, for example, Cold War is a, is a political uh, military manifestation of infinite game. A nuclear proliferation. Because you cannot play this game alone. Own, but the rules are always changing so you cannot the the the, the concept uh con, the word concept is to limit it means to limit and the problem with infinite is you cannot limit because limit is a finite concept it's a finite thinking the word concept is finite thinking the limits are finite the laws are finite thinking it it is order in fact it is order but higher order order is being able to have order perpetually flexible so it's a it's like a mix it's a balance between chaos and order where mm -hmm. you perpetually change things but not too fast so everything is chaos and not too rigid so everything is order mm -hmm. but not all, everybody can do it and generally people who have finite per, infinite perception are able to 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 influence societies in a way that allows for that thing all right 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 that would be like the esoteric or like the divine yes. uh uh hook and and sink sinker for the uh for the average person right like if you can tie like the mundane existence to something that is an infinite game like the movie cloud atlas did right like where you watch cloud atlas and suddenly you feel a lot better about your life exactly right uh, exactly yeah okay that's interesting uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why I, I so we can run with this for this next bit as well, which is how can we solve the resentment? Is revolution the only way, or can people be happy with what they have? And John's written, but when individual members of such a society emigrate into entirely new surroundings, they do not remain conspicuously decadent, pessimistic, or immoral among the inhabitants of the new homeland. Once enabled to break away from the old channels of thought, and after a short period of readjustment. They become normal citizens of their adopted countries. Some of them, in the second and third generations, maintain preeminence and leadership in the new communities. So one little side note here is, again, diversity is kind of interesting because if you're just doing diversity assimilation, is that actually respecting the diversity? Um, but that's a, that's a, I go into that more in that post I linked earlier. But in terms of resentment, I think for basic needs, right, if they're not being hit, that's survival mode. Uh, but the self-fulfillment needs, that's like the search for meaning, right? Which is either you are embodied with a uh, ethos of your nation that is uh, already embodied within you, in which case you're getting fulfilled, uh, like a conservative growing up in a conservative town, which is kind of booming from mining or other industry, right? Or, 
or you are but as those things die then and the environment becomes more chaotic more like a quicksand or a uh, marshland then you end up having to do a search for meaning which is to say well where should i go uh and where should i go physically where should i go intellectually where should my soul go uh and i think uh that's essentially then the question of uh for resentment is basic needs that's just about survival you don't even resent people you're just trying to survive but once your needs are met then you can focus on resenting people for the meaning aspect because resentment is an operation of meaning which is they are the enemy they took from me or you can view them as your collaborators uh so for instance in people with poverty like a lot of like in bali they can view foreigners as wealth and it's better to collaborate with wealth than to steal from it uh depending that's kind of the majority ethic there there is some bad people but uh you go somewhere else like thailand um and or phuket i should say specifically and you do it's now a different switch where it seems at least from my experience the majority is trying to screw you uh when the minority kind of view wealth as a collaboration um so you know, it's kind of the the self actualization game is the meaning game and resentment mm -hmm. is a easy coping mechanism to avoid actually doing some soul searching <laughs> well so, so far so good i <laughs> i have no further yeah. cons <laughs> no. all right yeah. so other than that i'll just read these uh choice quotes and, and we'll sign it off so some great wisdom that i found from the book so john has written people make money for themselves not for the country thus periods of affluence gradually dissolved the spirit of service which had caused the rise of imperial races and another quote then as we have seen came the period of pessimism with the accompanying spirit of frivolity friv frivolity 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 uh, and sensual indulgence by products of despair frivolity yeah yeah uh yeah and in this manner at the height of vice and frivolity the seeds of religious revival are quietly sown after perhaps several generations or even centuries of suffering the impoverished nation has been purged of its selfishness and its love for money religion regains its sway and a new era sets in it is good for me that i have been afflicted says this psalm psalmist psalm psalm yeah, psalm 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 is the, the, the religious text. psalms psalm right yeah that i might learn thy statutes another one decadence is a moral and spiritual disease resulting from too long a period of wealth and power producing cynicism decline of religion pessimism and frivolity the citizens of such a nation will no longer make an effort to save themselves because they are not convinced that anything in life is worth saving and the final quote if we could accept these great movements as beyond our control there would be no excuse for our hating one another because of them however varied confusing and contradictory the religious history of the world may appear the noblest and most spiritual of the devotees of all religions seem to reach the conclusion that love is the key to human life any expansion of our knowledge which may lead to a reduction in our unjustified hates is therefore surely well worthwhile so with that uh i want to thank uh kelly for joining me on this discussion uh i think we a few of our thoughts were on the frontier and i think uh quite interesting especially the aversion or the political tools as well i think we got to get some good things and thanks kelly for also recommending the paper uh we will be discussing uh or at least i will be discussing on the while well, the beverage channel will be discussing homer's works uh iliad as well as odyssey uh by the end of march uh so if you want to discuss that as well please join our discord the links will be in below be below i i certainly appreciate someone to discuss those books with me as well uh, and other than that, all the resources that we've linked, I'll put them in the description. Uh, and yeah, please join in. A lot of the benefit of this isn't just listening, but it's to be in the conversation as well, right? Like, so, and that's one of the other themes in this conversation, which is this playground of ideas is also about knowing what we know and then coming to terms with what we don't know and kind of becoming okay with that. And, you know, that's part of it, which is experimenting with these ideas, testing them out and finding things we can actually know. Uh, experientially and intellectually um 
and kind of get to the bottom of things. So yeah, really, really happy. Anyone who, who sought this <laughs> sought this out and, and listened to it, I hope it was well worthwhile. And uh, all the links as well as my annotated paper uh, will be in the description below. Uh, thanks so much. I'm going to uh, end the stream now.